Great, I'll just give everybody about another moment and then I'll get started. So good morning, everyone. My name is Dawn Krim. I serve as the secretary designee for the Department of Safety and Professional Services. And I'd like to call to order this first inaugural meeting of the Governor's Equity and Inclusion Advisory Council. I'd like to welcome everyone, all of our council members, as well as our community members who are joining via YouTube this morning. I'll begin first with calling the roll. Uh, Deanna, do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. Great, thank you. We'll be following Robert rules of order. Therefore, I will need a motion to adopt the agenda. In order to uh, call for the motion, if you could unmute yourself and then state your name and then the person making the second also state second, state their name, and then I'll say all in favor if you could unmute yourself and then reply affirmatively. Thank you. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? LeVar Charleston, I move that we adopt the agenda. Thank you. Is there a second? Vanessa McDonald. Okay. I hear Vanessa. Yep, Vanessa McDowell, thank you. All in favor of adopting the agenda as outlined? Aye. 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 Great. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, first order of business today is to uh, review our agenda and meeting materials. And so everyone has received the agenda in advance and we do have a PowerPoint scrolling with the agenda. But you also should have received six documents. Those documents include the meeting agenda and meeting PowerPoint a budget summary document that the governor will touch on briefly in his remarks, but we'll have more details about that in a discussion later. The state of Wisconsin definitions for diversity, equity, and inclusion, Wisconsin open meetings law summary, and Robert rules of order toolkit. So everyone should have received all of those materials. As stated during the meeting, we will follow Robert rules of order. And uh, when an action item is listed on the agenda, again, if you could um, unmute yourself and reply. And then if you have a question, concern, or wish to speak, please raise your hand. And Larice, who will be supporting this meeting, will uh, call on you and ask you to state your name before you speak. Thank you. We'll move to announcements. Uh, Malika? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of reminders. Um, make sure that you are muting your phone or your Zoom when you're not speaking during the meeting. Um, and then um, if you have questions or would like to speak to the group, um, we went through and raise your hand to be acknowledged. If you're having issues with raising your hand, just go ahead and put that information in the chat box. Um, and then once you're acknowledged, um, unmute your connection and please remember to remute once you're finished. Thanks so much. Um, I did also want to mention that the governor and lieutenant governor will be in attendance for the first part of the meeting. I think that you all heard me say that the governor's running just a few minutes behind, um, but be mindful. We have um, over, what, I think close to 30, a little bit over 30 people who are um, on the meeting. So as we are doing introductions, just be mindful of the time so that we can get through everyone while the governor is still on the phone. Thanks, that's all the announcements I have. Great, well, we will now move into our remarks and our introductions. So let me just check. Um, so we don't have the governor yet, is that correct? Lieutenant Governor Mandela, are you on? I am here. Wonderful. So let me just say right before I turn it over to you that um, 
Um, we are just so um, honored to, to have you be part of our council. We know that this council was created um, as advisory to the governor, Lieutenant Governor, um, Secretary Brennan. And um, I, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you all for your support. The support of the governor's office and Lieutenant Governor's office has just been invaluable as we have gotten this, um, this group up and going. So with that, I will turn it over to you for remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for having me. I uh, gotta just give a quick shout out to um, Brother Charleston. Feel it's appropriate to to acknowledge uh, to acknowledge him and all the all the work that he's been doing. Not that everybody else hasn't been doing amazing work, uh, but I just you know had the privilege of probably knowing him a lot longer than many people who were on this call. And now I get to hang this over his head next time I need to ask him for something. Uh, but in all sincerity, I am uh, truly appreciative to be here, truly appreciative uh, for this opportunity to serve with Governor Evers as we do the work to make Wisconsin a much more equitable place. It has been the thing that I've talked about since before I took this office, since my time in the legislature, my time during the campaign, and then uh, just upon taking office, I want to be sure that we promoted the core equities of equity and sustainability with an increased emphasis on equity because we know the challenges that we're dealing with here in the state of Wisconsin. So again, thank you. I want to thank everybody for being here. And I want to thank you all, especially for your commitment to the goals of equity and inclusion. And we are trying to promote this in a way that it has not been seen in this state before. And given the height of the negative statistics that we're dealing with, this is an opportunity for Wisconsin to be a leader, uh, as in so many other areas. If we can shift the dynamic, if we can uh, change the way that we do things, we can be an example for so many other places who are struggling across this country. And so I'm happy to be here for the first meeting uh, on the Council on Equity and Inclusion. And I know that, like I said before, so many of you have been doing this work within your own uh, capacities, within your own personal or and or professional lives. And I'm grateful that you all are willing to share and serve uh, share your expertise and serve and strengthen our work as a state. And like I said, the racial disparities uh, run rampant here. This has been the case for far too long. We know that too many children, too many families are being held back uh, due to unfair systemic barriers that continue to exist in this state. And this continues to impact people's health, their pocketbooks, their education, even the food that they have access to, the homes that they live in or don't the air that they breathe and so many more, uh, so many more issues of importance. And that's why we have to address inequities both within state government and outside of state government, not just to empower the people who are facing these barriers, but to make Wisconsin more successful overall. And when we came in office, Governor Evers asked which areas I wanted to work on the most. And I was very clear, like I said, equity and sustainability is what I wanted to focus the office of the governor on. And since and then, these have been the four principles of my office. And to us, these issues are interrelated. We can't protect natural resources or the environment without looking at the impacts that it has on people in different and disparate ways. We've exemplified that connection within our climate work within the task force on climate change by centering equity and environmental justice every step of the way. Diversity, equity, and inclusion were prioritized in determining the membership of the task force, the expert speakers that we brought in to present, the content and the topics of discussion in the meetings, and most importantly, the final recommendations. And this was new to too many people uh, on our task force, and as it is a new concept to too many people in general. Uh, and it wasn't always easy, uh, but it was definitely necessary for us to lay the foundation that will actually address the scope of the crisis that we continue to face. We have to have this lens in all of our work and everything that we do within state government. And this council is critical to making that happen. And so I just wanna say thank you again for everything that you've been doing to make our state more just. And again, your own personal and or professional lives. Uh, thank you for everything that you do to make us more inclusive, more equitable. And I just wanna just give a, um, a preemptive congratulations to all the work that you're going to do on this council because your work here will truly impact every single child in Wisconsin, every family, 
in every community uh, long into the future. A good friend of mine, Heather McKee, wrote an op-ed uh, a few days ago that talked about how racism impacts everybody. And as long as we continue to have these systemic barriers, these systemic uh, issues of inequality in our state, everybody will be held back. And that's the message we want to be sure to get across. Um, and also, it's just the right thing to do uh, for families in Wisconsin. And with that said, I am going to hand it back over uh, to you, Malik, because I'm not sure how the order is going to go now. Thank you. Um, I'll turn it over to Secretary Brennan now. Like, uh, and thanks, Lieutenant Governor, for uh, those remarks. And um, I appreciate getting the chance to be here today with my colleagues and with uh, so many of you um, who are doing great work all around the state of Wisconsin. And I look forward to working with you. Um, just a little bit, the, the, uh, the Department of Administration has responsibility for all of the human resource aspects across state government, more than 35,000 employees. We work uh, around a lot of the procurement um, and we work on enterprise and statewide issues around housing <clears throat> and other areas. Um, and so the, the work that we do here um, is really going to have an impact. And, you know, in, in every, as we think about the workplaces that we are in, um, certainly the, the state workforce, we've, we have reached an inflection point over the last year and even preceding that. Um, we are working differently. Um, the workforce is going to look a lot different. And, and from his first day in office, uh, the governor, the lieutenant governor have, um, have really instilled in this administration a focus on the workplace and on the workforce, a, a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is a continuation of that. Um, and, and really, we have to look at um, the workplace that we have. Uh, that we need to be able to be inviting and inclusive to people from across this state, um, because they're asking questions like, um, is this a place that I believe in as a workplace? And conversely, is this a place that believes in me? And there are, there's been lots of work that has happened as a result of Executive Order 59. Um, every state agency over the course of the 2020 calendar year wrote its own diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. Um, and that I know from, from our own agency and across the enterprise was something that um, was very inclusive and it was from the ground up very organic and something that uh, people across the, the state workforce wanted to be involved in and they want to see what, uh, what concludes and what moves on from there. So we're excited to do that. I was reminded from a colleague though um, elsewhere uh, from another state earlier this week in a conversation we were having around diversity, equity and inclusion, um, don't just show me the plans, show me the budget. And in the budget that was just introduced this week, the governor has put his money where his mouth is. And so the, the work that we do here and the work that will be ongoing over the next several months and into the, the future, um, will have a grounding in the investments and the priority that the governor and the lieutenant governor have laid out as well. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited um, about working with my colleagues, but, but really uh, excited about the, the people from around the state who are gonna be part of driving this in the future. So thanks very much. Thank you. Um, do we have the governor on yet? It looks like it'll be a, a couple more minutes. Sorry, there's a press conference running. Okay, thank you, Kara. Um, Don, you wanna go ahead with your remarks? Great, I do. And I'm um, excited for when the governor does join us because when you think about the work that we have in front of us, this is who he is. This is the foundation that he brought to state government and his leadership. I had the opportunity to work with him at DPI. And from day one, he talked about equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I'm really pleased and proud to lead the governor's council um, regarding these very topics because they're near and dear to his heart. But more importantly, it's about connecting the dots. He talked about connecting the dots in state government when he became the leader, and that's what we've been doing. It's evident in the grassroots work that Joel Brennan talked about around equity, diversity, and inclusion. It's, a, it's um, evident in the work that we're doing across agencies to improve the lives of Wisconsinites. And so what I appreciate about this initiative is we will have the opportunity to work with 31 members on this council 
diversity, equity, and inclusion leaders around the state of Wisconsin who will bring their expertise to this initiative so that we touch nonprofits and businesses and state government so everyone is included by having your expertise at the table, we're going to do the best work possible. And so I'm excited to be among the leadership that is you who have already proven the work you've done in your communities, already have demonstrated your commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and now we'll be able to work together to move it forward to blanket all 72 counties and process and proceedings that are undertaken on behalf of all Wisconsinites. So I'm really excited and enthusiastic to work with each of you to move this work forward. And I know that as the governor put together this council, he too thought about the expertise that lies in our community and around our state and wanted to bring it to the forefront and the nature of the work that we're going to be doing of, of, among the council. So that's what I wish to share for this morning. I'm excited to set the tone uh, for the state with you. And I look forward to us really rolling up our sleeves and moving process and policies forward. As the Lieutenant Governor, said, it's not just about equity, diversion, and inclusion, inclusivity. It's mm -hmm. about sustainability, environmental justice. And that's what I look forward to leading. Thank you, Madam Chair. I see that uh, the governor has joined us, so I will turn it over to him to make remarks. Oh, thank you so much. And I apologize for uh, uh, being a little bit late. We are opening up a uh, uh, vaccination site in, in Oshkosh, and we're just able now to... Uh, uh, to hook up. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks for all of you being part of this. And uh, this is a really important um, group that uh, uh, is assembled. Uh, we, we have to make sure that we are, we're able to uh, um, make sure that we're working on making the uh, equity and inclusion our most uh, uh, important issue uh, in state government. We've got a long way to go and I, I'm looking for you folks to uh, uh, help me. The, um, like I said before, in order to build a state that works for everyone, uh, our state government has to reflect the people they serve, and we have to be leaders in promoting equity and addressing racial disparities in our communities. Back in June, I sent agency budget directions uh, for them to follow as they crafted uh, their, their requests. In that letter, I asked them to bring compassion, empathy, and a specific intention to increase equity and decrease racial disparities in our state as they've crafted their budgets. Uh, because of that, uh, but also because the folks who lead these agencies already prioritize this work. We have a great group of uh, cabinet secretaries. We have a budget packed with new initiative to, initiatives to truly chart a new course for the state. Now, that's not to say that there isn't more work to do, that, that we, we have, uh, essentially, we, we don't have to roll up our sleeves because we do. But I look forward to working with and hearing from you all about what else we should be doing. I do not want this council to be a talking point. We want you to tell us what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong and what we need to do more of. We want your honest insights and recommendations because we can't do this work alone and we need your help in guiding us. And I know Secretary Designee Krim feels the same way and that's why I'm incredibly proud of her and appreciative of the work she is doing and leading the way. Dawn, thank you so much for taking this on. I'm really excited to take this uh, real step forward with this council to create meaningful change. State of Wisconsin, uh, as an employer is, is likely or is the largest employer in the state of Wisconsin, if we include the University of Wisconsin system. And we have to make sure that equity is a top priority for us. And by doing that, we can provide uh, an example of how uh, a, a large organization can uh, make equity a priority. So let's get to work, folks. 
Thank you very much. Really appreciate having the opportunity to hear from the governor, Lieutenant Governor, and Secretary Brennan. And what's important about their words is their commitment. There is action behind those words. And so as we look at pulling together this council to really focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion, we are tasked with doing the heavy lifting, but joining you in the heavy lifting that you have been already doing. And so with that, what I'd like to do is uh, go ahead and have our introductions by our council members. I will utilize the roster and call on you to introduce yourself, state your name, your organization, and then our question for today, our key question, is how are you showing up today? And so I will give you an example. Dawn Krim, uh, Secretary Designee for the Department of Safety and Professional Services. Enthusiastically, I am ready to roll up my sleeves and get to work alongside you. And so with that, I will go ahead and um, move to our next introduction. Joaquin Otoro. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Joaquin Altoro, uh, CEO for WIDA. WIDA stands for the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority, essentially a bank. Uh, Governor Evers, I very much appreciate the appointment to, to the position. We're coming up on two years, about a year and a half, and I am showing up uh, after two cups of coffee. I got all kinds of emotions. I wish there was a word for just like a mixture of emotions, but I, I'm very present, and so I very much appreciate the opportunity. Great, very present, love it. Emily Amundsen. Good morning, everybody. I'm Secretary Emily Amundsen. I uh, serve at the Department of Children and Families uh, where it is an absolute privilege. And uh, today I am showing up appreciative. I'm so appreciative of this council forming I'm so appreciative of all of the time that you are giving to this entity, and I'm very appreciative to be a part of it. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Nasreen Atta. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nasreen Atta. I'm representing the Islamic Society of Milwaukee, which is the largest Islamic organization in the state of Wisconsin. Um, I'm also a registered nurse, uh, emergency room registered nurse by profession, so that keeps me busy. Um, I am excited, I am thankful um, to join such a beautiful group of leaders across the state of Wisconsin, and I'm excited to work with you all. Thank you. Victor Barnett. Good morning, everyone. Uh, knowing of this call this morning, I actually rode by a park where 40 years ago, I started the Running Rebels Community Organization, which is a mentoring program. Um, so I'm just so excited and honored to be here, to be involved in the state working in regards to diversity and inclusion. So just overjoyed and excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jessica Bowling. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Bowling and I'm here representing the newly formed Asian American Pacific Islander Coalition of Wisconsin. And I am showing up um, curious, just curious to learn about this council more and uh, meet everyone. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Percy Brown Jr. Good morning, beloved community. My name is Percy Brown Jr., uh, native son of the great state of Wisconsin. I am representing the Middleton Cross Plains Area School District as the Director of Equity and Student Achievement. I also serve as Senior Outreach Specialist um, in the Wisconsin Center for Education Research at UW-Madison and also CEO of Critical Consciousness Consulting. Uh, and as far as I'm showing up, I'm extremely present, excited, and curious. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Kevin Carr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Kevin Carr. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Corrections. And, um, you know, what you um, may not know about the department is that um, we, we care for 20,000 persons at 37 facilities throughout DOC and 65,000 folks on community supervision. And the only reason I raise those issues is because equity and inclusion and systemic racism um, really impacts what we do at our agency. 
because of the nature of our work. So I am extremely hopeful, that is my word, hopeful that we're going to be able to make some real gains as a state and as a state government um, in the area of equity and inclusion. And I thank the governor for his leadership on this subject. Thanks. Thank you. Jessica Cavazos. Jessica? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry. I'm always thinking I'm ready, but I, I need some time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Cavazos. I am the president and CEO of the Latino Chamber of Commerce of Wisconsin. We are uh, the fastest growing uh, minority chamber in the state with over 450 members and uh, representing various industries uh, throughout the central Wisconsin region and uh, now on the east coast of, of Lake Michigan. Um, um, I am so happy to be here. I think I'm showing up more, more so uh, curious, humbled, and uh, also um, just getting my, my wheels turning on how I can be impactful. So thank you so much. Great, thank you. Dr. LaVar Charleston. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure, again, a pleasure to be here. You all warm my heart. So if you see me smiling a lot, it's because I, I am indeed blessed to be here. Uh, I am an associate dean in the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I lead our equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts. And I'm also a clinical professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis. Um, I'm showing up today energized. Um, I mean, I'm, I really am. I'm really energized to work with uh, an impactful group of, of colleagues um, to really contribute to uh, the development of, of a sustainable infrastructure where equity, diversity, inclusion, and importantly, belonging are interwoven into the fabric of every corner of our state. I, I love the mission of this group. I love the mission of the leadership of, of our secretaries, of our governor uh, in this space. And, and I, I really, you know, desire that our, that we be a state that is characterized or in a group that is characterized by action, uh, accountability, and importantly, commitment to this work of in, inclusive excellence. So thank you again for being here. Great. Thank you very much. Reverend Dr. Monica Cummings. Yes. Good morning, family. I am the Reverend Dr. Monica L. Cummings. I am the Assistant Minister for Pastoral Care at Bradford Community Church Unitarian Universalist in Kenosha, as well as a member of Cush's uh, Religious Leaders Caucus. And I am I am both grateful and honored to be a member of this council. Um, as all of you probably know, Kenosha, we it had a very difficult summer. Um, we continue to we continue to grieve and and move towards healing. And so I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be part of this caucus and, and, and the hope that the work that is done here will impact my community and help Kenosha um, move forward in terms of racial equity. Thank you for your words. Robin Davis. Good morning, everybody. I'm Robin Davis, um, president and CEO of Brown County United Way in Green Bay. I also serve as the co-chair of the DEI Task Force of the Greater Green Bay Chamber. I am um, honored to be here. I'm inspired by the work um, that all of you are doing and I'm optimistic about the future of our state. Thank you. Thank you. QL Amin. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is QL Amin. Um, co-founder with my brother Khalif el -Amin of Young Enterprising Society uh, here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And today I'm focused. Focused, I like that. Reverend Dr. Alex G. Jr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. I am um, the pastor of Fountain of Life Church here in Madison, longest serving pastor in our community. I'm also the CEO and founder of the Nehemiah Center for Urban Leadership Development, where we've been um, strengthening black leadership for the past 30 years in our community. And most recently through our Justified Anger Initiative, we're working with non-black allies to help partner with us in breaking down um, residual effects of, uh, of systemic racism 
And um, I'm really I'm excited about being here. I would say that I'm showing up intrigued. Um, our state motto is forward. And I'm impressed by this multidisciplinary team. And I feel like this is one of the state's best effort to really live into our state motto. So I'm intrigued to be here today. Great, thank you very much. Ruben Hopkins. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Ruben Hopkins, Chairman, CEO of the Wisconsin Black Chamber of Commerce. Um, our, our position has been for years that Black people should be the largest employer of Black people. Uh, and we are ready to go to work. We have members that are ready to go to work. We understand the work that has to be done, Black business leadership in the state. And we look forward to uh, giving as good as we get. So. Um, Let's go to work. Great, thank you very much. Dr. Carlton Jenkins. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I bring you greetings from Lowell Ele Elementary uh, kindergarten class and Robin governor told me to tell you that she loves you. That was her thing, her message from me to you this morning. So I told her I would definitely give the governor that message, okay? Uh, I went in to meet with the kindergartners this morning, explained to them what I was getting ready to do on this particular committee. And actually in kindergarten, the teachers are having this conversation with the students. So I thought that was powerful. And she chose love like Dr. King versus saying anything else about what's going on in our society. So that just reminds me how I show up this morning, knowing that I'm five generations out of my people being in slavery knowing that my people have been in slavery more than they have been free, but yet I'm 10 generations from kings and queens. So I show up this morning in truth. If we're gonna talk about equity and inclusion, we have to be real about where we are with our history and not our history starting in America, because we know that. Uh, and then in, even in 1848, when you look at the constitution here in Wisconsin, my people were in enslaved during that time. So governor, I am, Again, uh, grateful for what you're doing with this. And for those who don't know, the governor actually kicked my career in another, uh, at another level when he was state superintendent. And uh, he actually awarded Beloit, Wisconsin, uh, an opportunity to be a part of the Blended Learning Innovation Grant, which when we did that work, it allowed my career to actually uh, go to another level around what you're talking about, equity and inclusion. So I said that to say, He's been about this work a long time and I, I am pleased to be here and I show up in truth. That's what you'll get from me every day when I come to this committee meeting. And I'm the superintendent in Madison Metropolitan School District. I forgot to tell you guys that. That's a small job on the side. Thank you very much. Dashika Kidd. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dashika Kidd, and I am the program manager for the Racine Housing Resources, um, a nonprofit organization that helps first time home buyers and low and mod income families um, access grants and get into their first home. I'm also the uh, new program manager for the Racine Financial Empowerment Center. Um, which is a big deal for our city to offer free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling as a public service. Um, I show up today fired up, uh, ready to learn and ready to contribute uh, what, I, what I know um, and just roll my sleeves up and, and get ready to uh, tackle this big initiative. Um, this is a big deal for me and I don't take it lightly and I, I wanna contribute it as much as I can. Um, I'm born and raised in the city of Racine and I'm very passionate about my city and my state. Great, thank you very much. Mary Kolar. Good morning, everyone. I'm very honored to be with you this morning. I am Mary Kolar. I am the secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm the chief advocate for Wisconsin's 350,000 veterans and their families. I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone else that's on this council. I'm here to listen. Thank you very much. My J. Low Lee. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Milo Lee and my preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I serve as the diversity director at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. 
um, all the great words are already taken. Um, so I can say that I am authentically here. Um, I am a proud Wisconsinite, though not born here. Um, my family and I were able to take refuge in this great state and um, just know, um, it's good to know that, we're, that I'm not alone in this work. Um, so to my virtual family, I see you and I'm ready to be with y'all. Very good, thank you. Vanessa McDowell. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vanessa McDowell. I am the CEO of YWCA Madison, um, not to be confused with YMCA. Uh, but <laughs> our mission is to eliminate racism and empower women and to promote peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Uh, and so we've been doing this work in the Madison area for over 100 years. Uh, and I am the first African-American woman to lead this organization in its 108 year history. And so um, in the event of trying to uh, make some real change, I am showing up uh, today uh, as a disruptor um, and showing up as someone who um, does not accept the status quo of things and uh, really wants to be action oriented. So uh, from what I know of some of you all that I know in this group, uh, this is a disruptive group. So I'm excited to be a part of this group uh, to actually do some, some real work. Um, and so I am also a DJ. I say I'm a CEO by day and DJ by night. So I'm also DJ Ace on the side. So excited to be here. Thank you very much. Adin Palau. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, I serve as Assistant Director of Community Relations at UW-Madison and Chair of the State Council on Affirmative Action. Um, we all witnessed the, the signing of Executive Order 59. And I always keep in mind that that was long before the visible demonstrations of racial disparities that we have seen. So at the time, it was clear to me that we had a visionary leadership in the government uh, of Wisconsin. So now that we have this uh, great group of leaders to support um, our governor and lieutenant governor, um, I feel optimistic. And that is my word, optimistic about the future because um, I don't think that before we have addressed uh, racial disparities in this fashion and uh, we have the right individuals to move things forward. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Amy Pachasek. Good morning, everybody. I'm Amy Pahachak, Secretary Designee of the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development. Um, so our uh, department, um, in part, you know, supports all of the workforce and employers in the state. And one of our missions is to ensure, you know, equal rights and opportunity for all. So I am showing up here today motivated to be part of ongoing and continued positive change. So thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Amy. Tammy Rivera. Buenos dias again. My name is Tammy Rivera. I'm the executive director and lead organizer of Southside Organizing Center in Milwaukee. Uh, this is our 30th anniversary. And our tagline is to ensure that residents have a voice, a vote, and a vehicle uh, to organize. But at the state level, I think you'll be interested to know that our geographic district is the most densely populated and most diverse piece of geography in the state um, and has the largest amount of Latino AX uh, and Spanish speakers. I am feeling intentional today and um, very determined that uh, all of us together will be able to maximize this opportunity to dismantle the structures and systems that are accessible to the state and the state's reach. Um, and I think that we can start with uh, the low hanging fruit of what in our charge of administrative realm can we change immediately while we work on legislative uh, changes. And I think that's a mass amount of change that we can do. Great, thank you very much, Tammy. Shondell Spivey. Hello, everybody. I am Shondell Spivey. Um, I'm currently the Upper Bound Director at the University of Wisconsin-La Crosse. 
I also serve as the president and co-founder for Black Leaders Acquiring Collective Knowledge. And I am also a school board member for the School District of La Crosse. Um, I'm a Milwaukee native, love Milwaukee, much respect for my hometown, um, but I currently reside in La Crosse and this is also home to me as well. And I'm coming, I think I'm showing up ambitious, right? Uh, oftentimes in these conversations around equity and inclusion, we talk about going slow and needing to take time to do things and so on and so forth. And the reality is that some of us, we don't have that time. We've been waiting for years, hundreds of years, in fact, to move to um, equitable uh, processes and have equity in our hometowns and in our personal lives. And so that's how I'm showing up today. Uh, much respect to everybody that's here. Um, look forward to working with you all. Great, thank you very much. Greg Steinberger. Good morning, I'm Greg Steinberger. I uh, am the CEO at the Hillel Foundation at the UW-Madison. It's the Jewish Student Center on campus, the largest in the state. I'm, uh, I'm showing up ready to work and really thankful to be here and excited to, to meet everybody in this community. Great, thank you, Greg. Marie Summers. Suguli Swagwek, Wauna Dayalo, Nini Yet Gets. My name is Wauna Dayalo, and um, it means that I become aware and remember. My English name is Marie Summers. I am a council member of the Oneida Business Committee. I represent 17,000 Oneida citizens within our nation and worldwide. The Oneida Nation operates a manifested government operation, successful business ventures, and a wide array of community development projects. And we have 149 direct service programs while employing approximately 2,100 people. Um, <clears throat> today I'm showing up um, engaged, inspired, and prepared to provoke thought. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you for sharing uh, your true name with us. Karen Timberlake. Good morning. I am the interim secretary at the Department of Health Services. We have a mission of protecting and promoting the health and safety of all people across the state of Wisconsin. And so today I am feeling very grateful to the governor and the lieutenant governor for their leadership in convening this group and really setting expectations for us about the conversations we need to have and the work we need to do. And I'm also very grateful for all of you who said yes when you were asked to join this group. And I really am very excited to learn from all of you. I know that there's so much expertise and commitment gathered uh, in this council. And I know that our department and I as a person will be better for participating with all of you. Thank you. Marquesa Tucker. Good morning. My name is Marquesa Tucker. I'm the executive director of the African American Roundtable. We are a fiscal project of the Hmong American Hmong Women's um, <laughs> Hmong American Women's Association. I'm sorry. Um, and our uh, mission, where our vision is to ensure that all Black folks are empowered, organizing, leading, and transforming policies to change the trajectory of our community to thrive and to live at their greatest potential. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you very much. Dr. Odawa L.A. White. Oh, bonjour, Gakana, we are Ozabadi Sundagu. Odawa, Dr. Odawa White, Indigenous Kaz. And um, I just said my, my name is uh, Ozabadi, which is a um, uh, name that was given to me early on. And uh, <clears throat> It's interpreted that I can see through things. Um, and so that was the power of that dream and the name that was given to me. And so I just wanted to share that with you today. And I'm also um, Dean of Student Affairs at the Lacoudre Ojibwe College in Northern Wisconsin. And we're one of two tribal colleges and universities in the, in the state. And I'm proud to be here um, representing our, our tribe as well as our, our, our college. And um, I'm, I'm also grateful for being part of the, such a large initiative and just part of my culture is, is just expanding the, those relationships with others. And so I look forward to doing that um, with others. And um, oh, I, I just wanted also, I, I worked at U University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire too for um, 18 years. And so um, it's an honor to be serving with everybody on this, um, on this council. Miigwech, Gibbison, Demig. 
Thank you very much for sharing your given name as well. Beth Roblowski. Oh, good morning. I'm Beth Robleski, and I'm the Executive Director of Employment Resources. Um, we're a nonprofit that works with people who have disabilities um, to enter or re-engage um, in the workforce. Um, so we work with a lot of people who have an intersection of disability um, with race, gender, uh, gender identity, um, and that often creates um, barriers for their opportunity. Um, I come to the meeting today humbled um, to see this remarkable group of leaders um, serving on this council, and um, I'm eager um, to join you um, as a member and work together. Um, I have worked uh, with some of the people on this um, council already and know that they're incredible people. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. Great, thank you very much. Mai Zong. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mai Zhang. I am the president of Hmong American uh, Leadership and Economic Development here in Western Wisconsin. And um, HAILD, which is short for uh, Hmong American Leadership and Economic Development, was formed in 2019. Um, we work diligently and intentionally to address economic and social disparities to elevate uh, social equity in Western Wisconsin and throughout Wisconsin for Hmong and AAPI, along with our brothers and sisters in black and brown communities. And so with that, I am also a council member for the Eau Claire City Council, um, working on advocating for anti-racist policies in local government. And so I'm very excited to be here today. I come today challenged and eager to uh, working with everyone on creating how we could create a sustainable uh, and a systematic impact on um, the racial issues we have. And then also uh, how we could turn this diversity trend into um, a systemic culture change and culture shift that's gonna last for generations. So thank you. Thank you, my job. I believe I went through the entire roster, but I wanna pause for a moment just in case I missed anyone so they can introduce themselves. Okay, what I appreciate about the introductions were just the, the words. So as I opened up with enthusiastically, just wanna give you a quick rundown to let you know how this council has showed up this morning in order to really rise to the charge of the governor. Enthusiastically, very present, appreciative, excited, thankful, honored, curious, present, hopeful, humbled, energized, grateful, optimistic, focused, intrigued, in truth, fired up, authentic, <laughs> disruptor, optimistic yet again, motivated, intentional, ambitious, ready to work, engaged, grateful, humbled, challenged, and eager. But more importantly, alongside those words, what I also heard was readiness. I heard forward, if that is gonna be our state model, and those are the words and how we've showed up, forward has to play a role. And then a lot of hearing the readiness to get to work. And so as I stated, when we opened the meeting, this is gonna be a working council. And I see no one here needs to be convinced because you too embody that working council mentality. And as the governor, the Lieutenant Governor and uh, Secretary Brennan opened up, we are excited to take your time, your talent, and the state has put in the treasure accomplished. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Malika Ivanko, 
who will talk a bit about um, the diversity and inclusion initiatives and information that was sent your way. It is important to know that we, as secretaries and leaders of agencies, talked a great deal about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there were, as you can imagine, various meetings. And we wanted to be sure we were all on the same page with the pre-work that we're doing and the work that we'll be doing with the council. So with that, Malika. Thank you, Don. Right before I do that, um, since we are a little bit ahead of schedule, I just wanted to see if the governor or lieutenant governor had any last remarks or had any questions for the group just before we move forward. I'm well, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead. Lieutenant governor, go ahead. That's what uh, equity is, inclusion is all about. You know, you got the governor, <laughs> you know, put me first. So let that be the uh, initial lesson of this. Uh, <laughs> um, I just want to thank everybody seriously for being here. Uh, like I said, this is incredibly important work. I absolutely want to thank the governor for his dedication and his commitment uh, because it takes a real effort to put this together, but it also takes a willingness to put, to put this together. And as we know, that has not always been the case. And so I am uh, appreciative of your leadership, appreciative of your friendship, and uh, appreciative of everything that all the members of this council are bringing forward. And let me just tell you before I log out, we have so much work to do, but you already knew that. And that's why you're already doing the things that you're doing. And now the, the fact that we can come together and, and, and push forward as a, as a unit uh, means so much more. So again, uh, thank you all. For being here. Thank you for supporting us to make Wisconsin a much better place for everybody. Thanks so much, Lieutenant Governor, and thanks for your great work. And uh, um, yeah, we, we worked together on this pretty well, didn't we? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I've had the honor of being governor now for a couple of years. And uh, before that, I have done things all across the state of Wisconsin. And uh, in, those, in, in that time, you know, it, it is clear that, uh, uh, and I was born and raised in small town, Wisconsin. My first, uh, first opportunity to uh, uh, interact with somebody that uh, didn't look like me, frankly, was when I was a high school kid working in a canning factory and there were some uh, Mexican laborers that were working alongside me. That's the, you think about that. That's, uh, that was my introduction to uh, uh, what uh, diversity looks like in the state of Wisconsin. And having lived all across the state, and lived, lived in Madison, lived in other towns and across the state, um, the, the impact of 400 years of systemic racism is something that we will continue to fail at, unless we have um, good conversations with people that not only represent large organizations, but are people that uh, are, are activists in local communities. And, uh, and so this, this is a huge opportunity for the state of Wisconsin as an employer, as a, uh, and me as a, as a leader. Um, and in addition, the, uh, the pandemic, as you see, I'm wearing a mask here, uh, up in Oshkosh, and the impact of this pandemic has just laid bare, frankly, uh, issues of racism and inequity. And we have to take advantage of this point in time. I mean, clearly there was all sorts of incident, incidences this summer uh, that uh, uh, reminded us of how much work we have to do. And so, Donya, I didn't get to say what my feeling is, and it, I'm, I'm jazzed. You can add that to your list. I'm jazzed that we can actually make a, make a huge difference. We, we have that opportunity, and I know we have a great uh, diversity of uh, people that are sitting around this, uh, this rectangle that I'm looking at with people uh, listening to each other. And we, we have an opportunity. I, I hope you take this opportunity to help us as a state, as a 
as a state employer, as a state as state leaders, to uh, to move the needle and uh, and really make a difference. I, I I am so hopeful and so jazzed. I I am also frankly uh, uh, and and being a being a white guy, I, I I have not experienced what you have experienced, but we have such a long way to go. And there is so many political things that kind of stand in our way. And whatever we can do to kind of set those barriers aside and say, this is what we want this state to look like. And I, I just encourage you to be as bold as you can and, uh, and, and use this opportunity to really make a difference. I know that's why you're here. I know that's why, what you try to do every single day of your lives. But uh, by bringing you all together, uh, I am really jazzed that we can make some significant differences in the lives of all people in the state of Wisconsin. So, Don, thank you for your leadership, and uh, and Lieutenant Governor, thank you, and all of all of you that are here to um, uh, uh, be part of this. Uh, I'm very jazzed that this will be a significant uh, committee with significant results. So, thank you. And we thank you, Governor. And we appreciate the opportunity to be bold and direct, and as others have said, disruptive. But we will do it in a strategic way that focuses clearly on the charge that we've been tasked with. And so we thank you for trusting us uh, to do this work, to contribute the expertise around the square that you've noted uh, to move state government forward. And so thank you, Governor and Lieutenant Governor and S uh, Secretary Brennan for joining us this morning. This won't be the last time that we'll be all together. And with that, uh, Malika, I'd like to uh, pass it over to you. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. So I wanted to just take an opportunity. We sent you a document on the state government adopted definitions for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Um, as Don said, you know, it was important um, as a state that we were operating um, off, some, off of some of the same terms. And I, I didn't take an opportunity to uh, introduce myself to you all. I think that I feel like I, I, I've known you all a little while um, just because we've uh, had so many emails back and forth. Um, but my name is Malika Ivango and I am the administrator for the Division of Personnel Management. And I oversee the HR arm for the state. So all things compensation, training, um, labor relations, merit recruitment and selection, um, training, um, all of those areas for the entire state of Wisconsin. So I am honored to have the opportunity to work with you all and to, to have our team staffing the council. Um, one of the things that you will notice at, that's part of Executive Order 59 was the mandate for all of our state agencies to develop um, an equity and inclusion plan. And what we did was we took the, the requirements for our um, state affirmative action plan, developed new standards that were very focused, which we will be coming back to the group and talking about, and we'll let those agencies talk about these equity and inclusion plans. But as we began to develop those plans, we started hearing from um, not only the employees, but also um, our state agency leaders around just the terms diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if as a state we had identified what they meant and how we want to use them um, as state agencies and across the enterprise. And when I say across the enterprise, that's across all of our state agencies. And so what we did is we actually um, pulled all of our agency leaders, our cabinet agency leaders together um, to really have an in-depth conversation around those terms, the differences of what they thought about them, um, and then had an exercise to walk them through developing um, those definitions. And I, and I totally apologize for forgot to mention that also underneath that umbrella of HR is equity and inclusion. 
Um, and so we were able to walk them through that development of those definitions. And then once they were finalized, we shared them with all of our HR staff, our equity and inclusion professionals, and then all of the equity and inclusion committees to use um, to, to help in the development of those agency equity and inclusion plans. So we wanted to share those definitions with you all as a council so that you could see as a state, these are the definitions that we were operating off of. Um, and once we um, have that, we'll come back to the table again and talk about providing that update um, as far as the, the equity and inclusion, the definitions and the executive order, an update will provide an update on the executive order. And we can also answer your questions, more questions around these definitions if you have them then. But I just wanted to put that out there so that you have them, okay? And then um, if you'd like me to just keep going, I wanted to just really quickly talk about staffing. Um, we will be, our Division of Personnel Management will be staffing the council. And I we put this in here because we wanted to know, we wanted you to know that the people that you are working with. Um, so I have my right-hand person who is, um, Larice Lincoln, she is the Director of Equity and Inclusion for the division. Um, so she will be helping to facilitate and coordinate the meetings um, with me um, and, and with the chair and with the council and with the governor's office. Um, so as a team, we will be coordinating the, meeting, the, the, the meeting. So any, we'll be taking the minutes. And we have Nicole Gordiola, who is a part of Larissa's team, who will be helping with the, those minutes for us this morning. Um, any kind of Zoom coordination, any communications. I think that we've done quite a few back and forth emails with you all. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at the website, I put the link in an email for you all. Um, that website is now live. I'm so proud of the work that um, the, the team was able to, to help with. Uh, again, as I mentioned, it's really been a team effort in pulling the council together. Um, so um, I just wanted to put that out there that we will be staffing so, and we will also be um, hiring um, some temporary help just to continue to help, the, to help get the council up and running. So I just wanted to put a plug into that. And with that, I will turn it back over to you, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you very much. So what I'd like to talk about now is just how the council is configured. Um, as you know, there are 31 members to the council and there are term limits on the council. We are all appointed initially uh, for these uh, two years and there is an opportunity for uh, reappointment uh, at the end of the two years. But uh, initially we start with a two year term and then uh, there will be officers, and the officers will be appointed by the chair, uh, me, and there will be specific details to follow uh, regarding uh, the, the officers. Um, but know that you all are leaders of your own right. And so that appointment is based on your self-nomination. Um, and so be please be thinking about uh, what role you wish to play in addition to simply being among the 31. And so uh, I'll be chairing and there'll be a vice chair. And it, these are working leadership positions. The vice chair will preside over the meetings. If for some reason I am not able to attend, the vice chair will preside over the meetings. We will also have subcommittees and we will have subcommittee leads. Uh, the subcommittee leads will work closely with the vice chair uh, to do this work. And so we will be a working leadership team as we move forward the ideas and inputs and recommendations of the council. And so the way the chair subcommittees will fall is when we look at our top priority areas, we will, as a group, it will move into that section next, but we will talk about um, what those priorities are. And then I will look for self-nominations in terms of who is interested in leading the subcommittee. 
So it will be about your passion and your capacity to lead and do the work uh, that you should give some thought to uh, as you determine uh, what your next step will be. And so again, chair, vice chair, and subcommittee leads. The chair, vice chair, and subcommittee leads are appointed for one year. So two years on the council with the opportunity to be re reappointed and then in a leadership role, one year with the opportunity also to extend uh, that appointment. Now, if you take a look at your agenda, we uh, need to move into an action item. Uh, you uh, have received some proposed meeting schedules in advance. And so what I'd like to do at this time is uh, have you refer uh, to that proposed meeting schedule. And again, the Robert rules, we will um, take a vote uh, to secure the uh, meeting terms to agree upon. Madam, Madam yep. Chair, right before you do that, there is a question. Oh, okay. Tammy. Please unmute yourself, Tammy, and ask your question. Oh, um, sorry, Tammy. I just submitted it in the chat for the sake of not interrupting the discussion, um, but I'll read it now that I'm on. Um, as we craft the definitions or as you craft the definitions, um, I just had a question about the word disability um, in the diversity paragraph. Uh, when I worked in the disability arena quite a while ago, I have to admit, the, the term preferred was person of ability. So I'm wondering if the word disability should uh, be substituted with ability, but, but I submitted it in the chat. Thank you for that feedback. I will take that back to the, the leadership group. Great, Tammy, thank you for bringing that to our attention. And so uh, as we think about our proposed meeting schedule, the dates and times um, is something that we uh, sent out a doodle poll in advance so that you could respond. The quarterly meeting schedule will be um, based on February, uh, May, August, and November. And so, um, those would be the quarterly months. But when we think about the doodle poll, as people sent in uh, their responses, the most responses came in for Fridays, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And so now what I would like to do is I would like to have a motion to adopt the meeting schedule of meeting quarterly, February, May, August and November, and on Fridays, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Is there any discussion? Yeah, this is Vanessa. I'm just wondering, have we chosen a particular Friday? Is it the first Friday, the second Friday? I'm just wondering which Friday of the month it would be. At this time, there has not been a particular uh, date selected yet, just the day. And so that will move into the next uh, phase of uh, determining dates. Any other discussion? I would just, uh, this is Tammy, I would just um, for my own personal interest um, say I prefer it not to be the first Friday of the month. I don't know how that works for everyone else, but that's my need. Thank you for making that available. The staff will be looking through uh, dates and determining what could work best, but thank you for letting us know that. I have a, a question in terms of the dates that we have. Could you please state your name so we know who's speaking? I'm sorry. Uh, Carlton Jenkins. Thank yeah. You. Only question I had, if the dates align with the budget submission for the governor for his proposal and if we're going to be meeting in February, are we a reactionary group or we're going to be proactive? Uh, proactive. So does the date align with budget submission? Because what we are going to value and bring forth, it needs to be in the infancy of the discussion versus as a reaction to the discussion. And the budget reflects what we value. Great. Thank you for sharing that. 
As you'll recall, you received a copy of the budget summary uh, that was submitted by the governor and uh, announced earlier this week on Tuesday. Uh, the way the biennium budget works for state government is that budget is submitted every two years. And so the budget uh, as submitted by the governor shows his commitment uh, to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so I will uh, have you refer to uh, that budget summary. Uh, in future meetings, we will talk about it more in detail. So as I mentioned, February, it is February. So this is our first meeting. So our next meeting will be in May. Yeah. Ms. Graham, if I could. Carlson. Uh, and I'm Carlson, sorry. Good. I'm sorry, go ahead. Dr. Jenkins, this is Malika. I just wanted to mention, so we're saying that um, these are our regular meetings. If there is something as far as the budget that comes up um, and we need to pull the council together, we will absolutely do so. I mean, the budget happens on a biennium, biennium basis, mm -hmm. but these are our regular meetings. So if there's something that additional that is really important to the council that we need to pull you all together for, know that as a team, we will be open to that. Yes, and thank you so much, this is Carlton. I just wanted to say, I read through the budget. I was talking about in the emphasis of the thinking of putting it together, if there's a way that this committee could help influence. I think the things that are in there, they're pretty you know, much in alignment with a lot of my thinking, but I didn't want to leave out the opportunity for the committee to perhaps in the emphasis help shape some of the future direction in the next budget cycle. Great, absolutely. thank you very much. We appreciate that clarity and you are absolutely correct. The treasure has to go with the action. So thank you for that. And can I just also add that the, the governor's office, they, they will be returning to the group to give a, another budget update in, in May as well. This is uh, Percy Brown. I have a soft request to uh, stay away from the fourth Friday of the month. Uh, but if it can't happen, I, I will be able to rearrange some things, but that's just a soft request. Thank you. Thank you for making that soft request known. Yeah, so I've, I've now had two other soft <laughs> requests. I've had the first third and fourth as a soft request to stay away from. <laughs> Sorry about that soft request. <laughs> no worries. And, and just know that we realize it's always um, challenging when you're trying to coordinate schedules. And so uh, that's why at least the day of the week uh, was sent out in the doodle poll, but know that we'll do our best to um, accommodate people's schedule and have a steady meeting. The nice thing about polling in advance is the dates uh, will come up now. And so you'll hopefully we'll be able to set the uh, dates going forward with enough advance time for any adjustments that may need to be made or any inputs that we may need to get in, in someone's absence. This so is thank Shondell. you. Go ahead, Sean. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Shondell. Um, yep. Based on the comments that we have, it looks like the second Friday is probably gonna be preferred because there are some folks that are softly asking to not have the third <laughs> Friday. So, <laughs> so could we, um, is it possible to include second Friday if everybody's okay with that to, to the motion? Uh, I, at this time, am not gonna include it only because there are other schedules uh, in play of the staffing and others who are assisting with the meetings. And so um, right now there's not been a date, but we will be mindful of the uh, second Friday uh, preference in the other Fridays that were uh, <laughs> softly mentioned. And so with that, I am now going to restate uh, the motion and we'll have uh, people vote. So I'll now accept a motion to adopt the meeting schedule of meeting quarterly, February, May, August, and November. And uh, that Friday time will be 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, Jessica, so moved. Thank you. A second. LeVar, Victor Barnett, second. I think I heard LeVar Charleston and others, so we'll go with LeVar. Thank you. All in favor, please say aye. 
Aye. All opposed, say nay. The ayes have it, motion carries. And again, thank you all for your feedback on the uh, scheduling. And so now what I'd like to do is move to our council member training. Our timing is great. We are we're doing well, so I thank you all. I'm always mindful of the time, ensuring that we have adequate time to do the necessary work. And so I'm pleased to move to our council member training. I'd like to turn it over to Ann Hansen, our Department of Administration Chief Legal Counsel, who will conduct a short open meetings training for the council. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm really pleased to be here to help support the work of this really important council. Uh, again, my name is Ann Hansen. Um, and I just wanted to note before I get started that, you know, because this council is attached to DOA and you'll have the access to the great support by Malika and her team, I'll just also note that, you know, you'll also have support from DOA's Division of Legal Services. Um, and so you can work through Malika and her team to get questions answered as they come up and we'll be happy to, um, to, ha to help you. Um, I believe that one of my colleagues, Alex Arkin, may be joining us too, just um, to kind of be available here um, because Alex does a lot of um, open meetings advising and, and other things with the DOA attached boards and commissions and she will likely be interfacing with you. So I thought she might be able to join us. Um, and I also just want to plug that um, we are uh, we are also going to be asking you to do an open records law training um, that will be done on your own time uh, and uh, online. Um, but because this may be some of your first time uh, participating in this type of council, um, we just want to make sure you guys have the knowledge and tools uh, to know exactly um, how to conduct business and, and kind of what is going to be uh, subject to some of the both the open meetings law and the open records law. So stay tuned for more information on that later. So we'll just get started. Um, I'm going to go through this, I think, you know, um, relatively quickly. If you if anyone has questions, um, you know, I think uh, uh, Deanna will be facilitating questions, but also if you have questions as a follow up or if you take a look at the slide deck again and want to ask a clarifying question, please don't hesitate to reach out and the, um, mine and Alex's contact information is going to be included at the end of the presentation. So next slide. So just to uh, get started, the presumption here in the, and it's always um, good to kind of start with the why behind, um, you know, the law, especially when, you know, it may result in some, uh, you know, potential slight inconveniences. <laughs> it's always it's always good, at least for me to understand the goal behind it. So the goal behind Wisconsin's open meetings law is to promote transparency in government and to provide citizens with an opportunity to observe and participate in it. Um, Deanna, do you want to just at the start of the slide, just, you know, click through so that all of the, yeah, there you go. Um, there's, you know, the statutory language is on here, but for your purposes, what you need to know is that, um, you know, the law is interpreted broadly because it's intended to benefit citizens and give them an opportunity to participate and to observe the work of councils like yours. Next slide. So the law, the open meetings law requires that every meeting of a governmental body uh, be preceded by a public notice and held in open session. That's what we're doing right now. Um, this applies both to the uh, body itself as well as any subunits that might be created. So the subcommittees that um, Madam Chair was talking about would also be subject to these requirements. And we're gonna talk about what each one of these things actually means. So next slide. So what is a governmental body? Um, there's a definition in the law, but for your purposes, this is a governmental body. You are participating in a governmental body. Um, it's pretty broadly defined, um, but you know, council you'll see is right in the definition. So 
um, both the council itself as well as subunits are going to be subject to these requirements. Next slide. What is a meeting? <laughs> well, a meeting is a convening of members and um, that when they are um, gathering to, with the intent to engage in governmental business and the number of members present is enough to determine the governmental body's course of action. So a convening of members, um, it me is more than just convening in the same physical space. Obviously no one's really <laughs> convening in the same physical space these days. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about convening electronically, but for your purposes, um, convening via email can happen as well. And so we're gonna talk about that, but just be, um, be aware that whenever the group goes, gets together, with the intent to engage in government business. So to discuss or uh, further the work of, um, you know, within the realm of, of your, um, your mandate here, um, you are convening a meeting and then that's when those uh, requirements are triggered, both the public notice um, requirements and the open session requirements. So the intent to, and also, I just want to know, actually, Deanna, can you go back to the previous slide? When we talk about the number of members present is enough to determine a governmental body's course of action, um, you know, sometimes you'll hear this concept of a quorum. So it can mean both um, either the affirmative power to pass a proposal or the negative power to defeat a proposal. So um, depending on how uh, the body is set up um, and what constitutes a quorum, it would be uh, the convening of, of that many members that would trigger these requirements. And depending, you know, obviously there's a number of, um, there's a, a number of members of this council, it's a, it's a larger body, but sometimes when we have um, bodies that are just, you know, three members, um, you know, the discussion between two members could, could trigger the open meetings requirements. So it, it depends a lot on the makeup of the committee, um, um, what, when it would be triggered, but it's really the, the requirements we're talking about here are convening, so getting together, an intent to engage in government business and uh, enough members present that you can uh, control the outcome of, a, of an action. Next slide. So I mentioned that we we're gonna talk a little bit more about convening electronically because um, obviously out of necessity, um, a lot more business of state government is happening virtually, um, both in this type of forum, like, uh, you know, which would mimic, you know, an in-person meeting, but also via email. And so Deanna, if you wanna um, click through to there, thank you. Um, so, the use of email can actually trigger uh, open meetings requirements, which is kind of tricky. Um, email can quickly, you know, I think everyone is aware of the concept of reply all, right? Um, and maybe you've gotten caught on some reply all conversations that you didn't necessarily intend to be <laughs> included on. And then all of a sudden your inbox is flooded with, with emails. Um, but essentially when email conversations um, turn into something like an in-person conversation, even if it's not real time, uh, we, we get to be at risk of, of um, triggering the open meetings requirements. So email is something that you guys, you know, obviously are going to need to use to do the, the crucial work of this committee. Um, but I think there are there is some, just be mindful of when the committee is discussing um, things, you know, or member, individual members are discussing things that um, if we are, if the conversation moves more towards mimicking a, um, a, con a convening of members to, to conduct business, um, and there's enough folks uh, participating in the conversation that, that, that that's happening, um, we may trip over into the open meetings requirements. So the DOJ has some guidance on this and, you know, obviously we're happy to answer questions if they come up, but 
DOJ strongly discourages against using email to communicate as a group about these or to facilitate discussions about these things. So when um, folks are using email to do the work of the committee, um, you know, if you are, if, you know, a staff person of the committee or the chair sends out um, information to the entire committee and you have a response, you should reply directly back to the person who sent it to you rather than replying all to the entire committee such that, because we don't want to, again, trigger that, um, that type of full discussion without noticing the meeting and allowing the public to observe it. So you should reply directly back to the individual that sent it to you. Um, and then the person who disseminated the information can, you know, um, aggregate feedback. And then on the next meeting, you can put a line item on the discussion to kind of to flesh out exactly um, how members feel about it and to decide what to do. Um, so email should be used, obviously, for the important prep work for these um, matters, but you know, decision making and the actual business of the committee needs to happen um, with the sessions noticed in advance and um, with the opportunity for the public to observe. Next slide. These are the requirements of the actual notice. If you want to click one more time, Deanna. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because um, your staff from DOA is likely going to, to worry more most about this. Um, essentially, we have to um, you know, give notice to the public, to the news media, and we actually have to post um, the notice physically in a couple of places. Uh, I was just talking to Alex about um, how relevant the, the public or the um, the public posting of these things uh, has become particularly now where everyone is is doing most things virtually, but it's still a part of the law. And so um, the DOA staff will be working to make sure that whenever you guys are um, going to be convening in open session, we are meeting the requirements of the of the notice. Next slide. The timing of a public notice needs to happen at least 24 hours before the start of the meeting. And again, this is something that the DOA staff is going to be um, making sure, you know, you guys just talked about your schedule. So we obviously are aware of, of when your meetings are gonna be happening. If you have ad hoc meetings, um, something comes up where you have to meet, we'll just need to make sure that we get that notice out um, within um, the proper time frame. There is a, um, the law does account for a situation where you had to meet about something um, kind of on an emergency basis. Um, I don't know that that will be as relevant for this council as other governmental bodies, but um, if that, if that were to take place, if it's, um, if there's good cause or it's impossible or impractical to notice it within 24 hours, then, you know, the law accounts for that. But, um, but that likely won't, won't apply to you. Next slide. So one of the requirements um, of the law is that the business of the, of the council happen in open session. And so what does open session mean? Um, open session is something, is a, is, is a meeting held in a place reasonably accessible to members of the public and open to all citizens at all times. Um, reasonably accessible depends on the specific facts um, uh, and circumstances of who your audience is, who, who the impact, uh, the impacted population of your, your work is, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this, the open meetings law gives citizens a right to attend and observe open um, session of, of governmental bodies, um, but does not, the open meetings law does not, um, a, or require that they be given an opportunity to participate. Um, we're going to talk about what a public comment, you know, period might be. Um, but the open set, the open meetings law doesn't uh, require that you um, allow members of the public to have a, a you know, a portion of your time um, in the meeting. But they are um, given the opportunity to observe it um, and to know what's happening. And every meeting of a governmental body must initially be convened in open session. Okay, next slide. So 
So once the meeting is convened in open session, um, so what are the requirements of conducting the meeting? You know, the, the meeting can, the members of the meeting can discuss the topics that were described in the notice. Um, any aspect of a topic that was described in the notice or other reason, other issues if reasonably re related to the topic that was noticed. Um, Deanna, can you click one more time? There's another bullet there too. So just something to be aware of um, as members, as you're participating in these meetings, if a separate topic comes up, um, you know, maybe you'll have an, uh, uh, you'll be discussing one thing and, and someone um, you know, it'll trigger in someone's mind something else that you want the committee to take up or uh, a new consideration that wasn't, um, wasn't thought of before. So long as it's reasonably related to that topic, you can go ahead and, um, and discuss it. But if it's something wholly separate, you may want to defer that to another meeting or ske schedule a separate session to discuss it just so that, um, we can meet the requirements of giving adequate notice that it would be discussed um, and giving the public an opportunity to observe that discussion if they wanted. So something to keep in mind as you guys are going through your discussions. Again, reasonably related is a broad, um, is, is typically broad, um, but if it's something completely separate and you think that members of the public, um, you know, would have wanted to know that you were going to take it up, um, it's probably a good idea to defer it to a separate meeting. You don't actually have to, um, you know, talk about everything on your agenda if you don't get to it, or if you want to skip that sort of thing, and you can just kind of um, delay that to a later date. Um, you don't have to go in order; those sorts of things. That's not what the law requires. Um, but it really, again, going back to the why behind the law, um, it's intended to make sure that uh, the public has uh, knowledge of what. Type, what is going to be discussed at the meeting with reasonable specificity um, and the opportunity to observe if they're interested. Next slide. As I mentioned, there, um, there may be a public comment period as part of um, one or more of the, of the council's meetings and you're, you're more than um, uh, allowed to, to engage the public in whatever way you deem fit. Um, so you, what you would do is designate a portion of the meeting as a public comment period to give folks um, notice that they would have the opportunity to participate. Um, and then again, if you're, if you're having the public participate and a, a net new topic has come up that is not, has not been noticed or if, if a member of the public wants to discuss something um, that has not been noticed, uh, again, you should limit discussion about it, acknowledge it, and defer it to another meeting so that it can be noticed properly. Um, and anyone else who's interested in observing that discussion would have the opportunity to do so. And then, and similarly, you, you can't take formal action on a topic that hasn't been identified in the notice. Next slide. Closed sessions are something that are um, contemplated under the law as well. Um, the, I don't know how much this council will be using them, but, but it's certainly possible. Um, I didn't list it out I'll hear all of the reasons why a council may need to go into closed session. Um, the law accounts for a number of different scenarios um, under which that may happen. Um, most of them are related to uh, things that you might imagine would need to be in closed, se closed session, things like uh, employment or personnel matters or uh, litigation strategy, those types of things. Um, the point I wanted to make here is that closed session is a very is allowed under very specific circumstances, and it's not to be used just because the council believes that it would be, you know, easier to talk about something if the public was not um, present. Uh, I know that I, that's probably true <laughs> for a lot of things, um, but that's not the intent of closed session. So it's really. Um, only those particular instances that are outlined in the law, like I said, for things like personnel matters or litigation strategy or the like, um, is the council allowed to go into closed session? Um, and there's parameters around that. So if uh, the council did 
uh, want to do that, um, you know, we would work with the staff to make sure that all the requirements were being met and, and the notice um, was properly done and that sort of thing. Next slide. The open meetings law also has some record keeping requirements. Um, primarily what this does is make sure that um, the motions and formal actions that are taken by this committee are, um, are properly recorded. And so again, you're um, the DOA staff that is going to be assisting you with your work are, are going to figure out exactly how this happens. Um, but uh, for motions and roll call votes at the meetings in both open and closed session, you, you must preserve, create and preserve a record of those. Um, it doesn't prevent you from, you know, taking action by general consent without a formal vote or roll call vote, um, but it has to, to record that that's how the decision was made. Um, what can't go, what can't happen is, you know, for you to create basically an agenda full of, of actions and then just take a single motion to approve all of them at once. Um, the record keeping on this needs to be a more specific than that. And again, uh, the DOA staff that are working with you are going to ensure that um, some, some things are set up to um, make sure that the record keeping gets done. Next slide. Also, I've mentioned this a few times, but um, obviously we're in the middle of, well, middle, I, I don't know where we are. <laughs> Hopefully towards getting towards the, the later half, I don't know, I hope. Um, of the pandemic. And I think that this has been an interesting time for the open meetings law because, um, you know, we had to answer all kinds of questions about how do we meet these requirements uh, under the restrictions of, uh, of, you know, social distancing and um, things, you know, not being able to convene in the same way. And we, I, I don't know exactly what the council has in, has planned, but you know, as the years go on, we you may transition more into an in person, or you may continue to do things remotely. Um, but remotely held meetings are still meetings under the law, as we discussed. Um, even if you're not in the same physical space, it doesn't matter if you're doing it on Zoom, Teams, Skype, um, Google Hangouts, you know, uh, FaceTime. It's all. Um, regardless of how it's being done, remote meetings are, are meetings. Um, and so, you know, folks have gotten creative and, and more and more sophisticated about how the public should be able to attend the, this meeting. This is a great example. The fact that, you know, it's being streamed on YouTube um, is, is, is a, a really important um, way to make the discussion accessible to folks. Um, and if you go to the next slide, talk a little bit more about it. I think the requirements on this are actually quite minimal. Um, and so the council is already going above and beyond what's you know, minimally required. You know, before the pandemic, before COVID, um, you know, the, the, the um, guidance here was just that you had to make sure there was a conference room where someone had the meeting on a, a, a telephone essentially. Um, but, and you know, publicizing the, the number to, to call in or, or the Zoom link was, was a bonus. It was, it was more than what was required. I think that's becoming more and more standard um, and that's encouraged. And DOJ has been putting out some, some additional guidance on, on remote meetings um, as things have progressed. Um, but it's always a fact specific, you know, how much uh, or how to make it accessible to the public is always a fact specific analysis. Um, so, you know, if the audience uh, in the impacted population of a governmental body was, uh, didn't, you know, didn't have um, access to phone or internet, there would have to be a discussion about how to accommodate it. Um, you know, I think with what you guys have done here, this is, is well within the, the parameters of the open meetings law. Um, but, you know, just in general, um, these, these sorts of things need to be taken a look at on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, written materials that are going to be um, discussed should be available either at the broadcast site or um, made available uh, another way. Next slide.
there's some links here too about remote meetings and I'm sure if um, you know DOJ has additional guidance that comes out um, you know as we progress you know we'll be working with your DOA staff to make sure that that everything is is communicated to you um, like I said you guys are going above and beyond right now of the requirements and as I would imagine this council would um, making sure that it's as accessible as possible um, and you want to go to the next slide Obviously, uh, this is, you know, this is a very short um, training on open meetings. Just want to make you guys aware of the different requirements and really put that bug in your ear about uh, what it means to convene um, and what those different triggers would be, um, use of email, those sorts of things. But if you guys have specific questions, I don't know if it sounds like there may have been questions right now that we can take on, but also I just wanted to make sure you guys had my contact information um, and my colleague Alex's contact information and we're always happy to, to advise on anything that might come up in the future. Deanna, do you, or yep. were there specific things that we should talk about right now? There were a few okay. questions that came up um, in the chat that were uh, answered, but we'll see if Deanna has any additional things. There is a question, um, post COVID, will there be an expectation to come to Madison for meetings? Um, I don't wanna say expectation. I think that once we're finished with COVID, we will be then scheduling in-person meetings and we would highly encourage you all to participate in those in-person meetings. But we would understand, we know that some of you all are traveling quite a distance and so we would understand that. But of, of course, we would want to see you in person. And I saw the question about, you know, the advisory council not having direct impact on legislation. Yes, it still applies. Um, and you know, I think that was answered. But you know, you, the, the work that you guys are doing is is of public importance and is of public interest. And so, um, and obviously, councils are are included right in the definition. But um, but it there is a there is an intent that the public would have uh, a window into the to the work that you guys are doing. Uh, Ruben Hopkins with the uh, Wisconsin Black Chamber. I have a question. If um, if I'm on a subcommittee and I'm one person on that subcommittee, would it also apply if I talk to another person who is on another subcommittee, but we're not on the same subcommittee? Is that still an open meeting? That's a good question. Um, these are all the fun types of things that we get to noodle through. Um, I don't think it would because uh, unless you were the only person on the subcommittee, which um, I think okay. it creates a, because you wouldn't be able to control um, the action of the subcommittee at that point. Um, so really you're thinking about, um, and this is where it gets a little tricky too, if there aren't very many members on a subcommittee, um, if you have, if you're having a discussion via email with, if there are five members and three of five members are having a discussion via email, you're kind of treading, you're, you're, you're treading close to the territory of um, triggering the open meetings law. So, um, but just one person on one, one subcommittee talking to another person on another subcommittee um, likely isn't going to, to trigger it because both the numbers um, and the fact that you're two separate subunits of the same body. So the, so the only time it is actually, so if I'm meeting with a group of people uh, and, and doing some of the, uh, some of the things we're charged with, like reviewing and analyzing statutes and regulation and policy. So if I'm meeting with a group of people who, and none of which who are on the, um, the council, but I'm doing the committee work in order to come back to the committee and report, mm -hmm. that meeting with that group of people was not necessarily an open meeting. It's not, no. The, okay. Because what you're, the 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 group that you're working with is not a, a group within the committee so it's not a, a governmental body at that point you're just basically acting as a liaison from the council to you know getting feedback from outside the council and then bringing it back we're really talking about 
groups of individuals that are on the committee convening together to, to engage in the business of the committee. And so, you know, if you, if you had 10 members of a committee, five or more members of that committee um, getting together either virtually in person or via email to uh, make decisions and to, and to conduct the business of the committee. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Any other questions? So Anne, I want to thank you for uh, that short training and for posting your contact information should other questions arise. Uh, we really appreciate you um, sharing that information today. Thank you for having me. Happy to do it and look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now we'll move into um, our council priorities uh, section. And so you will recall that the council was asked to think about what focus areas you would like the council to focus on based on the charge given by the governor. And just as a reminder, that charge was to be bold, to um, this is an opportunity to move the needle. Uh, we really need, as Lieutenant Governor said, we really need dedicated, committed, willing partners to move the state forward when we think about the uh, number and level of inequities that our state is facing. And so everyone understands it is truly a working council, but when you think about equity, diversity, and inclusion, so many things come to mind. Uh, even as we think about the, the point that was made about what can we take care of immediately there, there are things that we can take care of immediately. And I know with the expertise that you all have, you are doing so uh, in your areas. And we'd like you to bring that passion and that focus uh, to the council. But there are clear parameters uh, set up in terms of what the charge encompasses. And so as we embark on this work, we're gonna stay tight to uh, what those areas are. And then as our work progresses and as we begin to move the needle, we'll be able to include other areas. So again, thinking about the focus areas uh, that the council is based on and the charge given to the governor, that's how we're gonna uh, narrow our focus. So the council will now use the next 30 minutes to discuss their list. The group will be split into virtual breakout rooms. So we'll have uh, basically four rooms for our discussion. And this main room will serve as one of the rooms. So you may not be put uh, someplace else, you may remain. So know if you remain, you're simply just a part of this particular um, room. And so what we're gonna do in those discussions is talk about uh, and try and determine what our top three uh, priority areas are. Each group will be having a discussion. We are asking each group to name, a, designate a facilitator and designate, designate a note taker. And then please be prepared to report out. Please make sure whoever is the note taker that your uh, notes are legible for others to read in that we will be asking you to email your notes to Deanna. And so based on the discussion that we have today and the notes that Deanna receives, we as the full body will have an understanding of what our three priority areas are. Once those three priority areas are determined, they will be the topics for the subcommittees. And so, again, as I speak about leadership, if you are thinking about wanting to be in a leadership role, the one of the opportunities is as the vice chair. 
but the other opportunities are as the leads of the subcommittee, and they would then be responsible for leading the uh, plans and actions in partnership with the chair and vice chair um, of those topic areas. And so, uh, are there any questions before we move to our breakout rooms? Okay, hearing no questions, um, the DPM staff will move us into the breakout rooms. And again, we'll have 30 minutes to discuss our list. We'll come back together. And when we come back together, we will have 15 minutes uh, for each group to report out and for discussion. So the goal is to leave this particular segment of work in, by establishing what our three priority areas are that the council will focus on for the next two years. And just to add, um, Madam Chair, we'll give you about a two minute warning as we get ready to shut those break, uh, breakout rooms down. Great, right. thank you very much. Thank you, I think we're ready, Deanna, thank you. Okay, as I look at the main room, it does appear that we have quite a few names, but know that uh, some of the people who are a part of our breakout room are um, staffing and assisting uh, those that are on the council. And so as I um, look at our screen, I notice our breakout room, we have uh, Dashika, Percy, Nazreen, Adawa, Secretary Carr, oh, Dr. Odawa. Odawa, thank you. <laughs> Odawa, got it. Uh, Dr. Monica and uh, Ruben Hopkins and Marie Summer, as well as Amy Pahachek. And so I am not going to lead our group. I am going to be among the participants like everyone else. And so um, I appreciate if someone in our group would uh, take the lead to facilitate and someone choose to note take. Hi, this is Nasreen. I can note take. Anybody want to facilitate? I'd hate for Not us to go in. back to the I, big I, group. I can be, I can be the facil, I can be the facilitator. All right, thank you very much. Take it away. Okay. Well, I am going to save us time and not do the introduction. So I hope you guys don't mind that there's just so many of us. Um, but facil but facilitation wise, this is just all about kind of who's at um, the virtual meeting here. So I'm just going to reiterate. I'm just going to put it out there again. Um, the question is, what are the three areas that you would like to see um, that the council to focus on in the next two years? Um, I'm an introvert as um, my, my natural personality. So I always like to give people time because I know everybody isn't a great on the spot person. So I'm just going to give everybody some time to kind of think about that as we were given time to read it, di digest it. Um, so I think it really works to the strength of kind of what this commit, what the sub um, or what the small group would like to do. Um, if anything instinctually comes out, if you just want to um, unmute yourself, um, and add to the discussion, um, or if you guys would like us to kind of go with kind of what the um, governor has given us as, as a budget, as a guide. Um, the person who's virtually on my top right now is Kevin Carr. So Kevin, I don't wanna virtually call you out, but you are virtually on the top of my screen. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, you know, 
in preparation for this meeting, I consulted with the Department of Corrections um, EAIC committee and um, asked them what did they think our top three priorities should be. And they all seem to fall under um, the category of better data tracking for recruitment related to equity and inclusion. And that would include applications, resume screening, interviewing, and where do we need to improve for a more equitable and inclusive hiring process within our agency. More specifically, if we were just going to name DLC, if we were gonna put forth three um, things that we think we should focus on, and I happen to agree with these measures in consultation with my group, is more measures to be put in place to eliminate bias during the hiring process, increased budget and investment for recruiting and, um, for in the areas of equity and inclusion, and then ensuring that workplaces are physically accessible for folks who need um, accommodations like wheelchairs and things of that nature. Because um, equity and inclusiveness is not just um, based on race or religion. There's also physical equity and inclusion that we should consider in the equation. So that's, that's pretty much where, um, where we're coming from the DLC on this right now. It was helpful to get that question, by the way, prior to the meeting for us to think about those, um, how we would respond. So thank you, um, Dawn and team. Kevin, thank you very much for breaking the ice. Hi, I'm the Reverend Dr. Monica L. Cummings, and I'll just add on to what Kevin said. Promotion is also important. So look at uh, what's the criteria for someone to be promoted and if that's a barrier around equity and inclusion. So Dr. Cummings, can I can when can I ask you to clarify a little bit of that? Are you asking for more like procedural or more transparency? Well, just adding on to what what um, what Kevin said, if you look at hiring, recruiting, um, and the and the infrastructure around that, promotion is a part of that. And so when you hire someone in, do they get hired in and stay at that level? Or do they have access to being promoted within, within the, the government structure? And so I would just add promotion to the recruiting. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Cummings. You're welcome. Um, so I'll go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. This is not my three, but I just wanted to add to the, um, the recruitment and hiring piece. I think it's also equally important, if not more important, to consider retention. Uh, so as agencies are, are looking to diversify their staff, you know, what are the things that they need to build into the system to ensure that they're return, uh, retaining diverse staff? Because uh, when you think about bias, yeah, you want to remove bias from the hiring processes, but bias and, and micro and macro aggressions are also part of the experience once we get folks of color into the system. So we have to be as vigilant to make sure that those uh, spaces are safe as we hire in our departments and agencies. Thank you very much, Percy. And is it Ms. Kidd, if I can have you go? Yes. I'm not sure if people are using their virtual hand. I'm not sure if that's a system that you guys would like to do, just so that we can save some time with the virtual interruptions. Yeah, and to add on what the team was mentioning um, in the hiring process, um, I think that the application process should be looked at as well. Um, if there is a question on the front that's asking, you know, have you been convicted of a felony or any type of charges that kind of discourage a lot of minorities from applying? So maybe um, rethinking the way that the application process is and kind of making it not so intimidating. Um, and then also one of my areas of focus that I would like to see um, would be for um, affordable housing for uh, minorities and persons with disabilities. Ms. K, 
Can I have you um, expand on that a little bit more just so that we can get a little bit more fruitful if you can share your expertise yes, on that? Yes, um, I feel that um, homeownership is the fastest way to build wealth. And I feel that a lot of minorities are left behind um, because of disparities in financial institutions approving loans. Um, we did a uh, research back in 2017 for Racine, and there was about 20, a little over 2,300 uh, mortgages originated. And out of the 2,300, there was about 117 for African Americans for that one year, and about 147 for Hispanics. So I believe that there are a lot of um, disparities in financial institutions and for home ownership for low and mi minority families. And again, we need to be able to get them to the credit score, get them to create a budget and get them into their home so that they can build that wealth and provide generational education and, and pass that along to their families. So for me, I'm very passionate about affordable housing and especially with persons with disabilities. Um, they're on a fixed income and they can't find a place to live that's, um, you know, in good condition. So they're living in poor conditions and they're, you know, it, it's, it's horrible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for expanding also. Kevin, I just want you to know virtually your hand is still up. So I'm not sure if you just didn't take your hand down or if you would like me to call out on you. Oh, the hand is down. I appreciate that. Hey, uh, you know, this technology is sometimes overwhelming. No, I, I, I'm just treating this like my classroom now where I'm just gonna virtually call you up. But if your hand is up, was it a uh, mistake? I'm trying to read people's virtual cues. So <laughs> I'm looking to see um, who hasn't spoken. I wanna give that opportunity for those who are waiting patiently. Um, so I'm looking at some of the names. Um, please feel free to unmic yourself. We talked a little bit about application. We talked a little bit about implicit bias. We talked about housing. Um, again, this is our opportunity to really brainstorm and then give to the whole group. Maria, I hear you moving. I just want you to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. There you are. Yes, thank you, Marie. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll give you a top priority and that's cultural training for the school system, There's the teachers. Um, I feel that that should be part of a requirement in part of their licensing curriculum um, to be knowledgeable of all um, different groups of ethnicity. Um, and I'll give you an example right now, you know, we've been neighbors in our nation with different jurisdictions and schools. And my daughter, she is a senior um, and the same type of lack of knowledge of our nation is existing the same way when I was her age. So the same type of behaviors still exist within the jurisdictions around us. So my thought is if the school systems, if the teachers start learning diversity and equity um, knowledge and skills, they can start pushing that through the grade levels, because I don't think that it's there now, um, especially in some of these rural areas where they don't understand that area or the different diversity of folks within their scope. So I think that's a huge one that we need to look at as far as trying to get that change promoted and you know, at a young age, diversity, equity, inclusion, so we can stop all the bullying, the, um, the race, the race racist, you know, activities that go on within the school system. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. I really appreciate that. I see a lot of hands up and I see Dawn, you're on the top of mine. So if you feel, please feel free to um, on, on mic speak and then put your hand down. Great. So um, the top three that I chose, I'm going to go off of the list that was sent to us, where it said the council is charged with the following. And there were uh, six bullet points. 
The first bullet point was identifying and promoting best practices and exclusive and exclusive, I'm sorry, and excellence in diversity, equity, and inclusion across the state. The second was reviewing and analyzing statutes, regulations, and policies to identify equity and inclusion barriers and recommend changes or amendments where necessary to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, taking into consideration the impact of policies surrounding homeownership, business development, education, and important issues. And many of the things that are um, that have been said so far kind of fall in those two categories, but know that the council charge uh, prioritization comes from that sheet. Um, so one of the things I would like to um, list as one of my top is providing membership recommendations to ensure that boards and commissions reflect the diversity of the people of Wisconsin. So I'm gonna offer that as um, among my top priorities. Thank you very much, Don. Yep. And is it Nazreen? Do, is, can, may I have you go next? Yes, Nazreen. Um, I just wanted to go off of Marie's um, point and priority. Um, so my main priority would be education. And I know that's a very broad term, um, but it was also going off of professional development and training for teachers and professors. Um, I, throughout my life, have taken countless um, diversity courses and trainings and so forth. And unfortunately, many of those have taught me inaccurate things about my own culture and religion and so forth. So I think it's important to have factual um, information and stati statistically correct information taught to our teachers and professors and students because I mean, it goes through the grapevine when it's taught to the teacher and professor, it'll then be taught to the student. And then based off of this, this will then influence change. This will, um, I would think, encourage then students to create their own diversity and inclusion organizations within their, within like the teacher group, within the student groups um, and so forth. Thank you so much. And again, I just want to put, if you had your hand, if you had your virtual hand up, if you just want to put it down um, just to make sure that I'm going to read everybody in order. Um, and I have Dr. Cummings on my next to speak. And Dr. Cummings, I just want you to know, I, I see your lips moving, but I think you were muted. Yeah, I tried to take my hand down before I muted myself. No, you did great. Thank you so much. Thanks for calling on me. And so to, to go on with Donna was saying, I'm looking at the list as well. And so my top um, priorities would be number two on the list, in which I think Dawn mentioned as well, reviewing and analyzing statutes, regulations, and policies to identify equity and inclusion barriers and recommend changes or amendments where necessary. I'm not gonna read the rest of it. Um, I didn't, then it's the one, two, three, fourth bullet, identifying and recommending strategies to increase the utilization of minority and women owned businesses in the state contracting process. And then the last bullet, which Dawn also mentioned, providing membership recommendations to ensure that boards and commissions reflect the diversity of the people of Wisconsin. Um, because when we look at policing, when we look at fire, I was just appointed to the mayor of Kenosha's uh, police policy and procedure subcommittee. And who has a seat at the table is really important. And what identities we bring to the table is really identity. And if these commissions don't reflect the community, then we're gonna continue to get decisions. We're gonna continue to have things um, not addressed to the depth that, that they need to be addressed in order for any kind of systemic change to happen. And so those are my three top priorities for the commission, for the council. Dr. Cummings, thank you for sharing. Um, Dr. White oh, Odawa, I, I have you next, and I think it's Marcasa. If, if I pronounce that incorrectly, I'm so sorry, Ms. Tucker. Uh, but we're going to have Odawa and then Marquisa speak. Okay, miigwech for allowing me to speak. Um, <clears throat> so, 
I would think that when looking at the list, I think we were talking about just the identifying and promoting best practices and excellence in diversity, equity, and inclusion across the state. And so we talked a little bit about the recruiting and retaining of um, diverse applicants and, and then diverse uh, professionals in, in the in state agencies. And I also want to add, you know, there it seems like there's a piece missing in there and that's the mentoring and then the training um, to promote those le the leadership skills within, you know, some of those administrative bodies. And so I think that, that that's one of my priority would be one of my priorities just based off of my experience working in the state. Um, I think also providing membership recommendations that boards and commissions reflect diversity of people in Wisconsin. And I want to make sure that, um, our native voices are, are heard um, as we have uh, 11 federally recognized tribes in the state of Wisconsin and, and each of them have that sort of, um, uh, they have the sovereign um, initiative within their own nations that, that govern what they, what they do. And, and so we want to make sure that all those, all those 11, the six Ojibwe and then the other um, federally recognized tribes are represented on councils across the state. Um, and then uh, the last one that I was looking at was analyzing and evaluating relevant information and data, establishing those specific goals and objectives, enhancing awareness, understanding and support for underrepresented groups. And so those are my three, um, just to be a little more succinct and um, let others talk. So miigwech. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Odawa. Ms. Ms. Tucker did, I, I think I saw your hand up. I'm not sure if it went down, but it's your turn. Oh no, I wanted to get the, the list, but it sounds like um, many of the ones that I would have also raised were also um, raised by others. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I think I mispronounced your first name. Can you correct me on that just to ensure that I'm authentically saying it in honor how you wanted me to pronounce it? Sure, thank you for asking. It's Marquesa. Marquesa, thank you so much, Marquesa. You're welcome, I really thank appreciate you. That. If I can just jump in though, even though Marquesa, some of the things you said were already stated, because we're trying to come up with a top three from our group, I think it's important to still reiterate um, your thoughts on those areas. Thanks, Mai. Thank you, and it's Marquesa, no H at the end, Marquesa. <laughs> oh, you know what? Thank you. Did Okay, no H on the end. Thank you. Marquesa. I was yes. just looking at what was typed into the chat. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no, that was, I was trying to help pronounce. Um, I would definitely say um, the second one, um, in regards to reviewing and analyzing statues, identifying um, equity and inclusion barriers, particularly, yes, around home ownership and business development, super interested in that. And also the last one got cut off um, around state cultural, what, what was the end of that? I think it was the, um, is it the membership re recommendations? Is that what you're referring to, Marquesa? No, I'm reading in the chat, the last bullet is cut off, I believe. Identifying, recommend recommending ways to engage, but at the end it says like state cultural, is that supposed to be events? I can uh, read that. Okay. It's identifying and recommending ways to engage, bring vi visibility, public acknowledgement, and recognition of community and state cultural events, activities, and initiatives of underrepresented communities in Wisconsin. And then the last bullet point is providing membership recommendations to ensure that the boards and commissions reflect the diversity of the people of Wisconsin. Oh yeah, that one, that last one would definitely be a priority of mine as well. And of course, identifying and recommending strategies to increase utilization of minority and women-owned businesses in state contracting processes. Thank you. No, thank you so much. And thank you, Don, I appreciate that. So I'm looking at the chat. I don't see any virtual hands up. 
Um, but I just want to make sure that I'm also giving everybody an opportunity who maybe weren't here at the beginning to, you know, kind of learn our kind of virtual ground rules that if you want to speak to just kind of raise a hand up because I'm looking at some names that may. Murray, I see you. Please on mic. I, I see your real hand up. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I just yes. wanted to, you know, I just added one and I don't, I don't want to take up the group's time because I know we have a short time. Um, part of my second one would be that do recommendations for Governor Evers Executive Order 59 to help increase the utilization of minority businesses um, through the following, establishing uh, DBE goals on a project by project basis. And, and I listed everything that's in there in the chat, but also, you know, just to have um, minority businesses be looked at and also get um, some support as we go through the diversity and equity inclusion um, goal would be a second one for me, okay? So Murray, when I'm looking at what, when I'm listening to what you're saying with also the charge that was put within the council, it looks like it's bullet number four, where it's identifying and recommending strategies to increase the utilization of minority and women owned businesses. Yep, one, two, three, four, yes. Okay. I just want to make sure because again, we were charged within this little group to bring three and I just want to make sure that everybody's authentic voice is heard, but then we also have what's important to us is naturally rising to the top, you know, so I, obviously everything is important. Um, so it's just one of those things where, you know, we're looking for what naturally rises within our small virtual group here. Thank you. No, thank you. And again, I just want to apologize. I, I have multiple screens on my desk and I have it all, you know, so I'm, I, I feel a little, you know, so if I have whiplash, I want to apologize as I'm trying to read the, the chat, see hands, but Percy, I see your virtual hand up. All right, thank you for that. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, I didn't print the initial sheet with the things that we should be looking at for the top three. Um, and I guess part of that is because I've, I've really been paying attention to the budget. Um, and, and I think that that's amazing um, because whenever we've had these conversations historically, uh, even up leading up to Dr. King's death, you know, he said he was going to DC to get that blank check. Uh, so I'm glad to see that there's going to be uh, some level of reallocation of economic resources to really make some of these things happen. But as I, as I think about things historically, um, as a black man and knowing that, you know, um, 2019 was a 400 year mark of uh, when the first ship of enslaved Africans arrived in this land. And, you know, in 2019, we had conversations about reparations, but oftentimes we get the pushback of it happened so long ago. I think we have an opportunity right here in Wisconsin uh, to Ms. Kidd's point to deeply examine home ownership in the state of Wisconsin, but in that uh, conducting a study to look at uh, the impact or the negative effect of redlining and how that really impacted and affected um, the establishment of building wealth through home ownership for people of color, but primarily black Americans or, or black Wisconsinites, because I've studied that in the Dane County area and it has contributed to the wealth gap that we see um, in Dane County. So I would love to see focus there. My second one is education. Uh, that's just my natural lane. And again, um, when I look at national data or statewide data or students with disabilities, when we shake it out, our black students are always at the bottom. Um, but as I looked at the budget, I do see um, additional resources for EL students, as well as students who identify um, as special education. And I've struggled with that for quite some time um, because you've got those resources allocated at the federal level and the state level. But again, when you disaggregate that data, uh, we haven't provided specific resources to deal with the underperformance of black students. So I hope that with the focus on education that we can really give some laser light focus to the lowest perform, uh, performing group of students in the state and, and allocate some resources to do better by that. But I would like to say focused on literacy. Uh, the third one isn't necessarily on the list, but I know Governor Evers is pushing uh, the legalization of, of marijuana and will use some of that revenue um, to invest back into the community. But my hope 
And one thing that I'm not seeing is criminal justice reform. Um, because when we think about you know, mass incarceration, that is the ongoing legacy of slavery by way of the 13th Amendment through incarceration. Uh, and when we look at the numbers, you know, from the 80s up until this point, uh, Black Wisconsinites are disproportionately affected uh, in mass incarceration, primarily by way of the war on drugs. So with the push for the legalization of marijuana, I hope that there will be conversations with uh, criminal justice reform in that arena. And I would just say overall, I hope that there can be some tweaking of the language uh, and maybe some studies added to some of the priorities as we focus in as a council rather than in education, rather than talking about the achievement gap. I'd rather reframe that and say, uh, repaying the education debt. Um, if we really understand the history of why we are where we are today with um, disproportionality and, and disparities in education. Uh, but then even with you know housing, let's own redlining and, and do a study with that to really help the state understand the why uh, behind the work of the council. And then again, that third piece, um, really you know acknowledging that incarceration is a 21st century form of slavery. And, and how can we use that to um, really change um, what we've been seeing to communities of color that way? So I know my There's, third thing is kind of off, but that's that's my focus. Well, Percy, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to, we were just giving the two minute um, warning about 45 seconds ago. Um, within that chat, I did take a screenshot of the charge just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So uh, hopefully, you know, our technology is working that you can click on that. I know that somebody cut and pasted it also. Um, but Marquesa also had an interesting point. Mar Marquesa, can I have you read what you um, put in the chat just to make sure that everybody is able to hear what you're saying? Yes, so I was reading over the equity and inclusion document that was sent to us regarding the budget, but I don't see it really reflected, I don't think, under any of our points, and that would be health equity, specifically around promoting community-based health equity initiatives. I think that that's super important um, because it talks about what is going to be best from, I believe, the root if we're talking about community-based um, to support needs from the ground up and that we're able to help to inform that through this uh, committee. Thank you so much. Um, and Don, I have, I, I see your hand virtually up. Yes, thank you for uh, calling on me. I just wanted to let Marquesa know that there is a health equity council that also is in effect uh, that is focused specifically on the health equity work. Um, so there's a couple of different councils that are all focused with uh, grounded in equity. So I just wanted to uh, bring that to your attention because that is not lost on any on the governor or any of us, the importance of that health equity work. So thank you. Can I ask a quick follow-up to what Percy asked about the criminal justice? I'm assuming there's a criminal justice committee then probably as well. Well, there's the task force that the legislature has put forth, but there also is um, quite a bit governor's budget that does look at criminal justice reform. And then uh, Secretary Carr is actually even a part of our council. And he too is focused in that area, but I don't want to simply just speak for Secretary Carr. Another quick, quick question. So is that the, that task force, the one that was just in the paper where Voss and I don't remember the other person was leading? Yes, Sheila Stubbs, uh, that mm. is, but it is separate from the executive branch and the focus that Governor Evers has regarding reform. Mm. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Well, one follow-up question to that. Um, I, I know as that committee, like Voss and, and Sheila coming together, that they were supposed to send a, a series of legislative bills in, in January. Um, has that happened and will we be interfacing with any of the work that they've done um, in our space? So I'm glad you've asked. Um, and I, this is the last question I'll take for now before we go back to the um, larger group. Uh, but that work is independent of the governor's work. Ultimately, the bills that will go forward will find themselves at the governor's desk. Uh, but they, uh, to my knowledge, has not gotten near that goal just yet. 
Thank you. Thank you, Don. I, I was just going to tell my small group, like just so everybody knows, everybody's joining our, our group. So it looks like it's expanding. And so I was like, it looks like we're having some kind of conversations. And I just wanted to let everybody know that everybody's joining us back in. And um, Nazreen, thank you so much for being our note taker and making sure that everybody's voice was heard and that our kind of what naturally our top three um, kind of naturally rises will then be facilitated to the big group. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and I would just say before we, you know, join the big group again, or it's already happened, it, yes. I, you did a fantastic job. Yep. Facilitating. Oh, Kevin, everybody's already here. So I was just like, <laughs> I, I say that, but the whole group is already here. <laughs> yeah, no, you did a fantastic job. I just want to Oh, thank you, Kevin. Right. The teacher in me comes out. So as the chair, I will re rejoin the big group. Uh, sometimes when you are the small group that uh, is utilizing the platform and space of the full group, uh, even though you get your two minute warning, sometimes it creeps up on you a little more quickly than uh, we had anticipated. Uh, so many of you got a chance to uh, observe uh, the end of our small group sessions. But we had the four small groups uh, taking place and and what we would like to do now is have uh, the groups report out. And as you'll recall, that reporting out is focused on the charge, the six points that were sent uh, initially when the council was announced by Governor Evers. And so uh, we have about 15 minutes to um, complete this task. And so I will start with our group since everyone has joined us and got the chance to see the end of it. So if the small group that I was in can please report out. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I was the facilitator and I, I, I don't know if, if that continues on to reporting out or Nasreen, you as the note taker, um, if I was just gonna say, is that something that you can assist with on that? Cause I kind of highlighted what our top three were, but I think you might be able to have better notes. Sure, um, this is Nasreen speaking. Um, we had a lot of different conversations, um, some off of the strategies um, and some not, but just going off of um, specifically these strategies, um, there was um, an overwhelming interest and prioritization of um, examining home ownership, um, which will just to pull off the bullets here. Um, let's see. And as well as the fourth bullet point, um, identifying recommending strategies to increase utilization of minority businesses um, we also discussed uh, providing the membership recommendations to ensure that people that represent us and boards and commissions um, also reflect our diverse um, group. And there was an also focus uh, of education that we talked about as well. Great, thank you. So if the group that uh, had Vanessa McDowell in it, if that group could go next. I volunteered to um, to kick us off and I'd really like to invite all of my group members to, to chime in and um, and help me with anything that, um, that they can add. But really um, we started our conversation talking um, specifically about some like large bucket areas. So education, health, housing, economic mobility. And that was sort of the, the entree into our conversation. Uh, we talked a little bit and, and were reminded of the Governor's Health Equity Council that is up and running and very robust. Uh, and many of us have friends and colleagues that are serving uh, on that council as well. So we started to wonder about the relationship of this council relative to that council and the intentional ways we can cross pollinate, which might then uh, free us potentially from um, the, the responsibility we all very much feel to keep health uh, inequities front and center. Uh, so sort of an open question, open wondering about that. Then our conversation pivoted to, um, I would say some of the systems and structures within any one bucket area. Um, so I'll throw out a few, you know, we talked a lot about 
funding. Um, we talked a lot about procurement. We talked about grants and contracting and sort of the language of government, the levers that we pull in government within any one of those topical bucket areas that um, either promote or sometimes um, uphold systems of inequity, right? And, um, and then we talked about things like assessment and how do we know that we're making an impact? What are the data tools that we have at our disposal across state agencies that could help us identify impact and how can we hold ourselves accountable to those metrics. Uh, accountability was a big word in our group. Um, if, we're going to, if we're going to say we're going to do something, how do we know we're going to do it? And so, so sort of um, identifying those systems within each of the work groups that could be consistent. Uh, and I would, I would say like policy levers, um, assessment and, and using data uh, to chart impact, and then like the accountability measures. How do we know that we're, um, that we're moving and we're cooking on, on these issues? So group members, what did I miss? I think, I think you summarized it uh, perfectly. I think we talked about uh, policy and best practices, oversight and accountability as a, a number two, and then infrastructure, I you know, identifying how we can shift the infrastructure that is currently um, or dismantle the infrastructure that is is uh, is uh, protruding from uh, mobility from you know whatever economic you know I think we talked about education healthcare but um, I I know that uh, Adin had a, a one, wonderful um, he, he summed it up really well at the end and I asked him to, to kind of chime in on what he just, he said at the end. Yeah, and I think that that was a great summary, <laughs> Emily. And, and so the idea of measuring, the measures to assess equity, regardless of what the specific area may be, uh, and the method for the assessments of the current practices, policies, infrastructure programs, actions, and the accountability that goes along with that uh, to identify the, the barriers, the challenges, how is that we are serving? And, and also that can lay out the, uh, the framework for how we are going to be measuring progress also in the future. Great, anything else on that group? Yes, one more thing. Um, I just want to ask Vanessa to just, we had an interesting conversation about the state as an employer. And uh, we happen to be a group that was, you know, half state agency folks and half uh, community leaders and partners. And, um, and I thought it was a really great point that you made, Vanessa, about the urgency um, to action that you feel that may may be different um, than a conversation about just the state as a large employer. Can you just um, summarize kind of your your point on that? Uh, yeah, I'll try. Uh, so basically, you know, we were talking about, you know, if there's a, you know, can we concentrate maybe on state employees? And I was like, well, that doesn't really resonate with me in the work that I do uh, because I'm working with the most marginalized folks. Uh, so they're not even, they don't even have jobs. Some of them, some of them, don't, you know, are working, you know, you talk about essential workers. These are those folks. Uh, and so, you know, the conversation turned to what are we talking about in terms of systematic stuff that we can interrupt, right? Policy stuff that we can interrupt. You know, I was given the example of uh, folks that were on um, food share and how the policy came down where you had to do drug testing. You know, uh, that was ridiculous. So there should be some, you know, work of this group that we can interrupt some of these policy things that are creating more barriers for the most marginalized folks. That's kind of what the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for adding that. And I, and I think if you turn your attention just a bit to the council charge, I believe number two is where that would live, kind of reviewing and analyzing structures, regulations, and policies that identify equity and inclusion barriers. And so exactly what you described, I would say, is in fact a barrier. And so uh, as you've pointed out, there are some historic 
um, processes that have been in place that need to be undone. And so I, I hear you and I see it uh, being there. So I'm going to put it in that bucket. Um, and I also appreciate the conversation that your group had about it not just being focused on state employees. It is a both and. And that measurement piece, the accountability, that assessment piece is important because that is what you hold against those policies to know whether they're effective or not and where the barriers are. So um, group two, thank you very much for sharing. Um, I will go to the next uh, group that would like to report out. Okay, we can report out. This is Carlton Jenkins, and I had a fabulous group. I'll just give you our top three, and then we'll kind of do this jointly as others had some really uh, good voice, great voice in this. Uh, our top three came out to be two, three, and five. Uh, initially, we had a tie. Uh, five wasn't in there. And one of our members brought up that we needed to bring the culture piece five in, and I'll have them explain that in just a minute. But if Maya, if you could just go ahead and give the notes from what we had, and then if, uh, Pastor G could weigh in on that other piece, and then Tammy about the dashboard piece too. And if you don't mind, can you please read those for the sake of our audience members? Yes, I could do that. Um, so our top three and we had um, it was really compelling the rest all of these charts were very important so we had a really robust conversation over reviewing and analyzing statutes regulations and policies to identify equity and inclusion barriers and recommend changes or amendments where necessary to advance diversity equity and inclusion take into consideration the impact of policies surrounding home ownership business development education and other issues. Um, this is where we feel that we would create more of the systematic mm -hmm. impact um, and the, that infrastructure putting into place of setting the tone um, on these policies and how that's applicable to us in uh, eliminating barriers. And so number, two, number three, charge number three is analyzing and evaluating uh, relevant information and data concerning diversity, equity, and inclusion, and establishing specific goals and objectives for achieving and enhancing awareness, understanding, and support of underrepresented uh, groups. Um, our group has um, spoke out about uh, the different disparities that has come out of COVID, um, about the health disparities within communities, marginalized communities, um, this is where we also talked about accountability. We heard that has come up um, with creating dashboards. Um, and we have one of our members that would talk a little more about that. But this, is, uh, this area allows us, will allow us to really bring the light in the disparities in communities of how we look at disaggregated data. Um, and then we, we had, uh, so we had a pull, a tie between uh, identifying and recommending strategies to increase the utilization of minorities and women-owned businesses in the state's contracting process, and the uh, identifying a way to uh, identifying and recommending ways to engage, bring visibility, public acknowledgement, and recognition to community and state culture events, uh, significant activities, and initiatives for underrepresented communities in Wisconsin. This is where we chose that and. Uh, Dr. A, you want to you want to share with us the importance of culture? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm leading a new effort um, in in the Greater Madison area. It's, it's the Center for Black Excellence and Culture, and it's really based upon a principle that uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Christy Clark Pujara, professor in, in UW history, says that uh, a defeated people don't create culture. So the fact that we have culture from our respective cultures prove that we're not defeated people. But if we don't celebrate those and enter into each other's cultural celebration, we only know what's pejorative about each of us. And so um, I rallied, I actually threatened to leave the council if the, if the group didn't agree with me, but I rallied, <laughs> I rallied for the celebration of our various cultures um, because that brings out the best of our story of resilience. And that's what we want people to know about us and not just what they read in newspapers or read statistically. Dr. Jenkins, you can unmute if you like. Uh, yes, I said we have a recovering attorney in our group 
And he actually convinced her and she made a closing argument. And that's how five got into our group. OK, uh, Tammy had something to say about the dashboard, though. I think that was important for us. Yeah, um, we want to make the work that we're doing accessible to the public, to especially the folks with lived experience. And one of the ways we may be able to achieve that is to create a simple uh, dashboard slash report card where uh, it is indicated what internal uh, sort of home at the state things we're going to do and where the progress of that is and then the external statewide items. So it's a, it's, it's a call to, to create a dashboard that is accessible for folks to check on what we're stating we're going to do, where we are, where we're stating we're gonna go and what our progress is or isn't. Great, thank you very much group three for um, those details. That dashboard sounds um, a great way to be able to showcase the, the good work that's happening both in state government and through this council and the celebration of the of culturally represented people and how they empower self and celebrate self are very important um, items to bring to bear. So thank you, Dr. G, for uh, bringing those forward uh, through group three. Now we'll go to the remaining group, group four, if you could report out. Absolutely. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Council. So we went um, maybe a tiny bit off script, but I think we got to the right place in the end. So one of the focus areas that we would like to recommend would be around wealth creation, which we think is encompassing of many of the things that have already been articulated, but can in particular uh, bring a wide array of people and interest groups and constituencies into this work. So if we think about wealth creation and how that affects practices related to women and minority owned businesses and contract requirements and making those real, how it relates to housing and home ownership and eliminating racism and other discriminatory practices in both lending and, and also in uh, the rental housing market. Um, uh, if we think about how we might use wealth creation to think about how we would invest in community organizations like many of the ones represented on this council that support and promote work in diversity, equity and inclusion. So kind of a whole suite of issues around wealth creation. Another broad um, uh, theme that our group lifted up is the governor's budget and the equity and inclusion issues that are, and, and initiatives rather, that are lifted up in the governor's budget. And you know, how do we have a focus, not just on supporting and promoting the ideas that the governor has put forward, but how can we also have a focus on fair and equitable implementation of whatever does end up passing through the budget process? And then two more, this is where we went a little bit outside the lines, um, two more things that really were important to our group. One is the, the topic of data that has been named a couple of times and, and uh, is called out in the charge to the council as well. And here we would underscore in particular analyzing and evaluating data as it relates to certainly all members of racial and ethnic group, minority groups, but in particular the uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander community in that we often fail to really disaggregate data effectively for members of that community, which makes it very hard for us to know how we're doing and how we hold ourselves accountable. Um, and then finally, we, we called uh, education out separately. We thought it could have been nested in within either the wealth creation or the budget um, group, but in particular, the phrase that was used is we're giving a lot of lip service right now around equity in edu and education and equity in education, and we need to move beyond strong recommendations to things that are more like mandates and consequences for failing to really achieve equity as it relates to um, education. And then if I could just say one other thing, our group also had um, a variety of really good, I thought, pieces of advice as to how the council should go about doing its work. And I, I wanted just to touch on those quickly as well. One uh, question that we asked ourselves was how we as council members can really connect 
and communicate effectively with the communities and groups that we all are representatives of and are connected to. You know, the, the point was made that this work is much bigger than anything 31 people can do. And so how do we really bring others into the work in a meaningful way and help the broader state community that we care about see the seriousness of purpose and really see this council as something that has teeth and is real. Um, we also talked about how do we talk about the work in ways that we bring allies all across sectors into the work with us, kind of the, you know, we all do better when we all do better frame, just because we're here to lift people up doesn't mean we're putting anyone else down. Um, and then on the policy change piece, some of you have spoken to this already as well, but we talked about that kind of continuum of what do we already have that's on the books that's not being enforced? What are the policies we need to add? What are the policies we need to remove and repeal so that we can really achieve um, the, the, the progress we all are committed to? And then finally, we too really underscored a focus on action and accountability. We agreed we've all been part of groups that talk and don't act and that we understand that that's not the governor's intention here and, and that's not our intention either. So I would open it up to any of my subgroup colleagues to see if, if others would like to underscore anything else. Uh, yeah, this is Reuben Hopkins um, at the Wisconsin Black Chamber. I, I just want to add that, you know, this is about money. <laughs> and uh, and if we're going to make the changes in the inclusion and, and the equity, getting money into the hands of the organizations that are actually doing this work, uh, getting the money into the YWCA, getting the money into Victor's organization, hell, I'm sorry, I didn't mean hell, heck, getting the money in the, the chambers so that we can do the work with the businesses and grow the businesses and create the economies that are going to be necessary for this thing to pay off is something that we have to be focused on because it is about the money as much as we haven't talked about the money uh, uh, in, in this process today. And so I'm hoping that uh, you know, I want to see the black com business community grow. I want people at the table who can help us get this done. And I'm hoping that be, by being on this committee and my voice uh, crying out to all of you who, who are listening that um, our culture and everything that represents uh, us cannot get better if we don't reinvest in this central city. And I mean the central cities around the country, but specifically here in Milwaukee because uh, I'm in Wisconsin. So um, I, I just think that um, we have to be, you know, honest about what it is that these conversations should be about. Madam Chair, you're Thank on mute. You. Thank you. I can't hear you. Madam Chair, if you're talking, you're on I mute. I should probably unmute. <laughs> right. I just want to thank uh, Group 4 and Ruben with the uh, added uh, additional information, all of the things that you've shared along with the other three groups. Although we were focused on the charge and the six bullet points, some of the other ideas that came out of the groups were uh, an incredible emphasis on education and uh, better teaching, better mandating, really having an impact. Also, uh, group four talked about wealth creation. Health equity was a theme that came up across three of the groups. Uh, criminal justice reform actually came up as well. And so I appreciate that people have thought about some of these other uh, items that aren't necessarily focused in the charge early on. We realize equity, diversity, and inclusion is, is going to be a big lift across all areas, not just in state government, but you have to start somewhere. The nice thing is there are um, alliances and connections dot cross it, dot connecting, if you will, across other industries. And so, for example, as you think about DPI and the uh, close relationship state government uh, as a 
under the executive branch, uh, under the governor. Uh, DPI is an independent agency, but yet uh, very closely aligned with the equity, diversity, and inclusion goals that you see here. Uh, so those conversations uh, can take place. There is a Governor's Health Equity Council in which uh, the leadership of this council and that council will stay in close communication throughout the work of both councils so that we are taking in consideration some of the suggestions, ideas, and recommendations that come up in both areas. So we, we actually identified that even going into this first meeting. I've always, already had a first initial meeting with the chair of that council uh, because we had anticipated the health equity piece covering both areas. But I appreciate the discussions that were taking place and the reporting out. Please, note takers, do send in your notes, email your notes to Deanna Sellers, who we've been communicating with as a whole. But I hear your passion. I we know of your expertise, which is why you're here. And so I really look forward to the um, narrowing down and focusing. Um, of what those top priorities will be. And once those are determined based on the notes that were sent in and today's discussion, we will send those back out. And then again, I remind you that we'll be looking for a vice chair and we'll be looking for subcommittee leads once those are determined. And uh, we all will be doing this great work together. So I appreciate your passions this morning. I'm going to uh, now turn it over to Malika uh, to talk about future uh, meeting agenda <coughs> items. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quickly, um, I wanted to call your attention to just a couple of things that we have on the agenda just to get us started for the next meeting. And then we also would like um, any feedback from you. You're welcome to either email us or you can put it in the chat as well on things that you might be interested in. But we wanted to talk about and have a discussion around guiding principles. We tried to get to some of the more core foundational things for the council today, but really talk talking about, you know, when we think about how the council is moving forward, what's important to the council, like I've heard the accountability and the collaborations and the partnerships um, and materializing some of that language. Um, I mentioned at the start of the meeting that we also wanted to um, come back to the group. Everyone has that executive order 59 that really gave the initial um, going forward for the council. And there are some other things as it relates to equity and inclusion that we want to update you on and what um, some of our state agencies are working on um, as part of that. Um, you'll notice we've had some of our secretaries, I think that we have nine of our cabinet agency secretaries, which is our highest level leadership, just in case you didn't know, our highest leader, um, highest um, level leadership that are part of these meetings. So when we say Secretary Carr, he is head of the Department of Corrections. Um, Madam Secretary, who's also our chair, she is the secretary for um, um, safety and professional services. Um, so we also wanted to give them an opportunity um, to come back to the council and talk about what their agency is responsible for, those roles and responsibilities, as well as some of their major efforts around equity and inclusion um, to keep you informed that way. And then there um, is a um, one of our governor office staff will come back and talk about you know how state government works. Um, again, if you all are advisory to the lieutenant governor, governor as well as Secretary Brennan, we want you to understand how things work with state government, and it's a really nice presentation that that person gives. And then <clears throat> there has been some discussion today around well, how does this council differ or how does it align with, how do we make sure that we're partnering with some of these different councils that you all have mentioned. So I've heard the, the, the racial disparities, um, that policing task force, the equity council, there is a climate change council. And these are some of a couple of them that are appointed by the governor, some that are not in um, allowing you to understand 
what some of the government councils and commissions are and that appointment process, um, because that's going to be very important as you all are looking at, as a council, what you want to focus on. And so there's not a lot of duplication of efforts. And I know um, I have been, we, we've had a couple of requests for meetings just with some of the other commissions, just to make sure that our work is aligned. And so um, we want to be careful, but we also want you to know what those um, councils and those commissions are for your information. Um, and that will also help inform your work. So those are some of the things that we have um, on our agenda. I also um, mentioned that um, we wanted to also then come back you know, the governor made his budget address earlier this week, but right now that's kind of a moving target. So we'll come back and give you an update of how things are going and where things are with the budget. That's all I have, unless there is, um, again, if you have any other suggestions or things that you would like to see put on the agenda, please put them in the chat or send me an email. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you very much, Malika. We've done a great job on time in terms of our discussions and getting through materials. Yes. So we have just a few minutes for a question or two. So I am going to open it up. If you could raise your hand, I will call on you and we will keep it moving. Marie Summers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask if in our next agenda that we have um, incorporate mini breaks, maybe five minute restroom breaks. I didn't want to leave. So I just feel like I don't want to miss anything. Thank you. Thank you. Great suggestion. Will do. My Saul. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I just have a quick question. I know that sounds like Malika mentioned, there's multiple different questions regarding how this is related to other task force. Um, and as we are talking about being optimistic and looking at the longevity of this, what is the intention of keeping this, um, this commission sustainable long-term um, and the work that we are doing today that's gonna be a long-term impact and continuation of it, even throughout different administration? Thank you. Great, thank you for that uh, question. And so this council initially is convened for two years uh, with uh, the leadership being one year and they're renewable for two. The governor's um, appointment or the end of his term ends in two years, so it coincides. But what's most important about the work that this council does is looking at policies and procedures so that we create sustained work that has an impact despite who is in leadership. And so that's why as you looked at some of the points in the charge that we want people to prioritize, it's where do we have a sustainable lasting impact so that if our seats are not filled by us and other leaders are in these seats, they are working off of equitable, inclusive policy across state government. That's what's important. And then when you think about the connection with the other councils and commissions that Malika talked about, the, especially the ones that have the statutory standing, they can move those points into statutory language. So it's important that we do good sound work that's accountable work with the dashboards that have been talked about so that it could be sustained uh, going forward. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one last question. Okay, so what I'd like to do is just there, again- There is a question. You. Okay. I'm sorry, there was a question. Thank you, I couldn't see it. Please go ahead and answer, ask your question. Marie wants to know when we will, when they will know the top three. That's where I was going to go next. Thank you, Maria. Bathroom and top three, I'm on it. <laughs> and so uh, what I want to share is uh, the DPM staff will be taking the notes 
uh, that were sent in, and they will be alongside, along with me, uh, and the governor, lieutenant governor, will be looking at the charge and determining what those top three are. The staff will compile that information as well as look at the preferred meeting. Uh, the motion that was passed today, Fridays 9 to 12, looking for dates, and we will be sending that back out. My sense is within two weeks, but I don't want to push Malika and her staff because that's where I, that's what our target is, is two weeks. And when that comes out, I also will remind you to think about if you'd like to move into a leadership role with the council, either in the vice chair or to lend your time, talents, and passions to lead one of the subcommittees. So we're looking at now about a two-week turnaround, but again, I don't want to speak for Malika and her staff. So Malika, does that sound good for now? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were asking me to speak. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to yes, speak we, for you. Yes, <laughs> yes we, we will make that work. How about that? <laughs> okay. Um, so again, I'm always mindful of time and we are at 1259. And so know that I will be respectful of your time because I know you all are busy leaders doing great work in the community. And so we thank you for the time that you allot uh, for this council and for the time that it will take outside of the council uh, between meetings to get this work done. So with that, I will ask, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You take care. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Keep safe. Thank you.